Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. We are so excited to kick off our Iron Flame deep dive today. Oh my gosh, the day has finally arrived. Iron Flame is a highly anticipated sequel to Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros, and it came out earlier this month in November, and the book community, first of all, went absolutely nuts, and now we all need to process it. Which is where Lexi and I come in. Now, before we start curing this book hangover, please listen closely to our content warning. Most importantly, we are talking spoilers for all of Iron Flame. We may be focusing on chapters one through six today, but we are bringing the entire book into the conversation. So if you don't know what pleasantly fuddled but not entirely sloshed means... This is not the place for you. I don't know. I feel like I do actually kind of know what that means without (laughs) needing to read the book, but you all get the point. (laughs) This also, of course, means spoilers for Fourth Wing and anything else from Rebecca Yaros. It is all on the table here, folks. However, you do not need to have listened to our eight-episode podcast deep dive covering Fourth Wing in the lead up to Iron Flames released. By all means, if you want to and laugh at our theories that we got oh so wrong, you can, but you do not have to listen to those in order to do these deep dives of Iron Flame, which by the way, if you're new to the Fantasy Fangirls Party, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy you're here. Next content warning. This podcast is rated R. We of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things about an adult book. Lexi, there is (gasps) drinking and party in this section. And thank God, thank God, that's the only adult content we ever talk about here at Fantasy Fangirls. Not ever the hot, taut muscles of Zayden Ryerson's body. Nope, absolutely not thinking about that one. I can't even like look at you with a straight face like that. Last thing before we jump into our first Iron Flame deep dive. If you love fantasy fangirls and you want to support us in making this dream podcast our livelihood, and if you want more content, more community connection, discounts on merch, early access to episodes, and so, so, so much more, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, the Cadet tier and the Dragon Riders tier, and our Patreon community is insane. Like I knew they were going to be incredible, but they take first place of Patreon communities ever to walk the planet. We did our first monthly live Q&A recently and it was so (laughs) much fun. If you want to join in the party, the link is in the show notes or YouTube captions, depending where you're watching this. And really and truly, thank you so much for helping us bring these episodes to you. And now, Lexi, it is time to graduate. We will still be friends forever. (laughs) Forever means very different in this world. (laughs) We always begin our episode deep dives with Battle Brief, aka Nicole's summary of what happens in the stretch of chapters. So let's kick it off with chapters one through six of Iron Flame. Take it away, Nicole. Part one. Chapter one, the second book of our story opens up with Violet in the middle of a huge revelation. The biscuits and Erasia are good. Oh, and Brennan is alive. Brennan, or Lieutenant Colonel Asari, stares at his sister and tries to fill the awkward silence, but Violet's inner monologue is giving us readers a recap. Erasia is being rebuilt after getting scorched six years ago. Venon and Wyvern are real. Who knew? She's been mended by Brennan. Oh, and Lexi. Did you know that Brennan is alive? Brennan leaves for an assembly meeting, but Violet is determined not to just sit around and wait. On her way to snoop out this meeting, she is baffled at the beauty of Ryerson House. I mean, there's actual art on the wall. Lexi, wow! More on Ryerson House today in our archive section. Finding Imogen and Bodhi, she joins them to eavesdrop, but not really, on the assembly meeting, which is in full swing and run by just peaches. But two things are very clear. One, the assembly does not like to agree on things, including the idea of the eight Russian survivors going back to Besgaev. Two, Violet Sorengale cannot be trusted. And thank goodness our shadow daddy is sitting on his chair. Hello, throne room scene. And looking like he don't give a fuck. He is loud and clear that Violet Sorengale is his responsibility. Yeah, she is. Zayden outs the eavesdroppers and assembly is shocked. They're listening? The door is open, Siri. Calm down. The meeting is dismissed. Really, this could have been an email. And Zayden clears the room, finally giving Violet and Brennan the opportunity to talk about the six years, major Yzma voice here, he's supposed to be dead. 
I did my best. Chapter two, time for answers. After an awkward silence, Violet starts firing off her questions. Here's what we learned from Brennan. He knew that she was in the writer's quadrant and that she survived. Naolin didn't fail, but it cost him everything. Yes, we will be talking about it. They had to destroy the box that Garrick's dragon found. Also, the boxes Navarian made? What? Erasia has a dormant ward stone. Brennan thinks that they have about six months before the Venon are at their doorstep. And Brennan doesn't remember shit from their father. How did they function without Violet? I am truly baffled. Violet leaves the room mentally agreeing with Taryn. She has to go back to Bezgaeth. Speaking of that curmudgeon, it's time to see some dragons. Violet Brennan, Brennan's dragon, Marb, Taryn, and Sigale all meet up. But what the fuck is that? And Darna is huge. Well, sort of. Half Sigale size. And her scales are fucking black. And much to Taryn's dismay, she's a teenager. Oh, no. Oh, no. Zayden joins along with the other six Bezgaeth students who are ready to roll on out of here. And Darna wakes up with the energy of Bambi learning how to walk, but Bambi with some sass. We do learn, however, that she can no longer stop time. Zayden has a plan to get our golden one, if we can even call her that anymore, back to the Vale, but they gotta move fast because it's time to graduate. Chapter three, 18 hours of flying later. Woof. Taryn and Violet approach Bezgaeth along with the rest of the riot who fought at Resin. As they walk towards the college, Violet and Zayden have an out loud conversation, far too intimate to speak mind to mind. But our favorite shadow daddy does not mind reminding her that they've been far more intimate when she's been wrapped around his. <clears throat> Violet wants to know if there's any other scribes that they can trust in the rebellion. Zayden shuts it down. Nope. No scribes. They also create a plan for handling the Dane situation. But it's not throwing him off the parapet or dick punching him. Sad. They enter Bezgaeth and the two go into Liam's room to gather his letters from Sloane. Cute weeping. But Violet's ability to keep her mouth zipped is immediately put to the test when she runs into her squad. Violet gives Liam's letters to Reed to hide so that they aren't burned with the rest of his things. A very fairly paranoid Zayden rushes them away to the rotunda and Zayden takes a huge L. I'll tell you some answers. And cue the start of some major conflict for this dynamic duo. Violet issues an ultimatum, but cocky Zayden is like, lols, good luck with that. The group walks outside to formation and Zayden's and Garrick's names are being called on the death roll. Awkward. Chapter four, Captain Fitzgibbon says it perfectly. You're not dead. <laughs> Colonel Atos is immediately unhinged. Inconspicuous, my guy. But General Sorengale is pissed. Zayden spins their story. They were attacked by griffins on the flight to Athbane, killing Day, Fuel, Liam, and Soleil. Violet steps in and shares her selective truths, but also that she was sliced open by a poison-tipped blade. Mama Sorengale is irate with Colonel Atos. Clearly, his discretion lacks all common fucking sense. God fucking damn it, Dane's dad. She dismisses the showing, and graduation continues. Dane breaks formation towards Violet. Violet, you're so Safe. And Violet replies in true Parks and Rec meme fashion. Touch me and I swear to God I'll cut your fucking hands off and let the quadrant sort you out at the next round of challenges, Dane Atos. Violence, indeed. Zayden makes this whole spectacle of it. She's mine, Dane Atos. Violet is looking up at the heavens. Kill me now. Zayden puts Dane in his place with one word, though. Athbean. That shut him up. Graduation finally continues and the third years get their orders. And... That's it. They're second years now. Yay? Chapter five, who's ready to party? After a quick chat about the mysterious village of Shantara and a download of what we can expect from the second year at Bezgaeth, we, in Violet's head, learn that she's dealing with some major survivor's guilt, making it really hard to go back to the swing of things. The squad starts asking questions about Violet and Imogen's war games, but luckily Imogen covers and they all cheers to Liam. Quinn quickly changes the subject into something nice and lighthearted, like advice on not getting attached to the first years because they're probably going to die. Way to lighten the mood, Quinn. Zayden captures Violet's attention, and she excuses herself from her squad to go talk to him. Oh, and Garrick is there too, but not for long, because he's ignored, and he leaves with a figure your shit out. Garrick, come back. I need more of you in my life. Zayden and drunk Violet have their moment together, and they pick up their earlier conversation. Violet needs full honesty. Zayden needs her to start asking questions, and he'll answer them. Get used to this, friends, because this will be a common theme in this book. But this lover squabble is interrupted by Colonel Atos and a major with a perfect uniform and a perfectly cruel smile. Dun, dun, dun. Atos introduces this man as a new vice commandant, Varish 
and get ready to hate him with a fiery passion. We had practice with Dane last year. It's time to put it to use. We learn that Zayden has been sent to Samara, a southern outpost on the front. But Varish does his first heinous thing and hands Zayden and Violet their missives. Every fortnight, you get to fly to one another. Rotating these trips put them at seeing each other every seven days. Atos turns to leave, but not without a not-so-cryptic secrets die with those who keep them. Yikes. And again, sly, my guy. Chapter 6. This was absolutely a death promise. Violet is furious and out in the courtyard, Violet lets her lightning rip. But there's other cadets around. Oops, sorry. Zayden and Violet say their goodbyes. We learn that Sigail and Taren can't communicate from that far away. They can't put anything in writing. Violet cannot involve herself in any marked one's missions, and she can only trust those who were at Resin. Oh, and Zayden is going to continue being a morally gray, cocky prick. Just as Violet is about to give in and kiss her shadow daddy, he pulls away with a anticipation is good for us and for us readers. Violet pulls the I can go fuck anyone I want card and confident cocky Zayden comes back out to play. You can, but you won't ruin me, Zayden Ryerson. Zayden leaves and re-comes to comfort her friend, but she's shining with pride. The bad news, Dane is a wing leader. The good news, Re is a squad leader. Her first orders to her squad though, the not at all ominous, live. Easier said than done. Oh, I forgot how hard those were. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's so good to be back in these deep dives. Great job, Nicole. Let's now tap into our signet power. This is really the bulk here of these deep dive episodes where we are going to discuss key insights, reflections, foreshadowing, and of course, all of our favorites, theories. Before we even dive into the story itself, I want to start with the dedication. It's to my fellow zebras, not all strength is physical. If you were like me and you wondered, why a zebra? From the Ellersdano Society, a common saying in med school is when you hear hoofbeats behind you, don't expect to see a zebra. In other words, look for the more common and usual rather than the surprising diagnoses. People with rare and chronic illnesses, though, spend years trying to figure out what the heck is going on with them and hearing answers like, you look normal. You are probably too young to have so many problems. You can't have that. It's too rare. A lot of my friends have chronic illnesses and every single one of them have heard these exact phrases and more. It's heartbreaking, really. The zebra became the symbol for EDS and HPD, hypermobility spectrum disorder, because sometimes it is the unexpected. Quote, sometimes when you hear hoofbeats, it really is a zebra. Also, not two zebras have identical stripes. Just like everyone with EDS, and HSD aren't the same as well. Now, this was just a fun little addition from the EDS Society. A group of zebras is called a dazzle. That's lovely. That's, I love that's that. That's so delightful, yes. And I've seen on social media, a lot of people were over the moon to see the dedication to my fellow zebras. And I think that just proves how much care and attention Rebecca is putting into the representation in this book. So I thought that was just beautiful. Then right after the dedication, we get the content warning. And woof, this set me in the mindset of like, oh dear, we are about to get emotionally wrecked by this book because it just goes on and on and on and on. Psychological and physical torture was a eye opener. This is when I was like, oh dang, we're about to see some interrogation. When we were doing our deep dive of Fourth Wing, I was really convinced that we were going to get some level of interrogation. But I can honestly say I wasn't expecting it to be a class. <laughs> at all. And I love this because the content warning just keeps on going. It does say an animal death. I am curious because I'm guessing she means Bade, but we didn't get that in Fourth Wing when Day died. So it was just an interesting addition to Iron Flame. And now as we move forward, the transcription, it is the same as in Fourth Wing. So I'm, I'm going to pull out the first half of it here. The following text has been faithfully transcribed from Navarian into the modern language by Jacenia Neilwert, curator of the Scribe Quadrant at Biscayeth War College. Now, like I just said, this is the exact same as we saw in Fourth Wing here. I do want to point out that no matter how our five book story ends, it sounds like there will still be a Biscayeth War College at the end of it. Either that or it falls and Jacenia and a group of others are like in charge of recreating it hopefully Maybe. with more truth involved i'm assuming since justinia would be the curator of the scribe quadrant also people have pointed out the rankings in the epigraphs for each of the chapters so for instance one says cadet violet sorengale lieutenant zayden ryerson and also there is one where it's cadet Jacinia Neilwert. It's interesting the dichotomy between curator of the scribe quadrant at the beginning. Now, there is a lot of people who are 
very, very worried at the recovered correspondence from Lieutenant Zane Ryerson and Cadet Violet Sorengale, considering the fact that those are their current statuses. But throughout the book, it is everyone's current status. However, there is one notable difference and one notable ex- exception, and I will be talking about it later in this episode. Ooh, I don't even know what yeah, you're talking about here. I'm excited. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Now let's get into the book itself. So as we open this up in chapter one, first of all, we did do a bonus episode in what mid-October on this excerpt and the audiobook excerpt from chapter three as well. So it's really fun to now reanalyze this with the context of the whole book. So if you want even more on just chapter one, please go listen to that other bonus episode. We did like two hours on eight minutes of audio. Like there's a lot there. So chapter one's epigraph is from Cyrilla Nowert. Now, Nowert, that is the same last name as Jasenia. So I think that we can gather that this is either Jasenia's mother or maybe an aunt figure. This public notice is from six years ago, so it absolutely must be someone older who has, of course, graduated from the scribe quadrant. And it's also notable that this is like the public notice for the erasure burning. So we would assume it's not only someone who has graduated from the scribe quadrant, but it's also someone who is high up the rankings as a scribe. I am really leaning towards mother on this one. Like I think you mentioned in, in the bonus episode that it could be an aunt, but knowing Rebecca's writing style, the mother just has so much more weight to it. And we also get a excerpt from Silverilla Nilwert later on in this book when she's discussing the transfer of power of Tyrandor. But we'll cover that when we cover those chapters. And while we knew this at the end of Fourth Wing, it is reiterated here. Arisha was burned by Dragonfire. And so you have to ask... By which dragons? You know, my guess is at minimum, Coda was definitely the one who torched it. I definitely think that Aimser was involved with this as well, Lil Sorgengale's dragon. And at this point, let's throw Colonel Atos' dragon in there too, because God fucking damn it, Dane's dad. <laughs> DFDDD. <laughs> I agree completely. I agree completely. Coda, absolutely. I'm really leaning towards Aimser being firmly absolutely as well. We have it confirmed in Zayden's POV chapter from Fourth Wing, the, not the bonus one, but the one we actually get at the very end, that Violet says, my mother saw the burning with her own eyes. So if Lilith was there, we can strongly assume that Aimser was there as well. And considering her rank, she would probably be the person who roasts Erasia. That might be another reason why Brennan is a little bit peeved at her, huh? So speaking of Brennan, we open and what we can guess is less than an hour after where Fourth Wing's cliffhanger left us. If you somehow forgot, it ended with Brennan saying, welcome to the revolution, which shocked a fandom to its core because he was supposed to be dead. Violet had just been mended by Brennan and Arisha after she was stabbed with a poisonous dagger by a venom because guess what? They're real. So she's dressed, she's healed in enough to be on her feet. She's now eating with her brother and no Zayden's around. So we're all caught up. Let's say yeah, less than an hour later here. I love Violet's thought process as she She's processing all of this. I love how it catches us up with the end of the last book. Violet is reciting all these big, unbelievable things, and she's just still actively processing everything that has happened to her in this past week. This is also brilliant from Rebecca. You know, In sequels, we have to have some element of the first chapter being a recap for the audience. Not everyone does 23 hours of podcasting on a book. So having that first chapter being the here's what went down last book is really important for us readers. But what I love is it's not forced here. It's Violet's natural processes of thinking. And it's always something that stands out to me in a book series of when they do it well, because you don't really notice it when they do it well it just feels like it's part of the story but there are some times where it's like oh we are in recap mode and it feels a little forced but this is not at all it's just it's so brilliant from Rebecca I love it I absolutely agree just like the setup within sequels is so important I believe Harry Potter is the star example of how to do that catch up there with what's happened in the past books to get you all caught up and moving on with the rest of the story here I always think of Order of the Phoenix for that one because it's like Harry laying out in the the grass or in the bushes, like listening to the news. And that's how we get the recap. Yep. Those books do it right. All right. And guess what? Brennan is 
alive. He's grown up in these years. We can guess that he's between 30 and 32 years old. Yes, I did the math. But war and the secret revolution have aged him, understandably. Violet notices his dimple is, quote unquote, the only boyish thing left. I love this description, quote, which now has tiny lines at the edges of his eyes. It must be shocking to see someone who you knew so well six years later and it's like you saw them and then you blinked and then they're six years older. And so I love, again, we're always talking about Rebecca's show, Don't Tell, and just lines like that, which has tiny lines at the edges of his eyes. It's that way of describing that he's older. And also, he's probably been really stressed. He's one of the leaders of a revolution that will age someone pretty quick. And I just, I love those little descriptions. It's so beautiful. Throughout their short time in Arisha here, Violet keeps thinking about he's still so him, though. No matter how much Brennan has aged these past six years, no matter how mad Violet is at him for faking his death, no matter how much she realizes he is kind of a stranger now, she feels this familiarity that you only have with someone who you knew so deeply for so long. There's that line, quote, it's the most Brennan move ever. You can only say that about someone you know so well. And it just that those six words have so much subtext and so much history behind them. However, Violet is definitely giving her brother some sass. To be honest, I would be pretty pissed off at my brother too if I'd been mourning his death for the past six years and it's like, oh, hey, you're actually alive. <laughs> I would be furious. Like, I think she's going easy on him. I would have <laughs> ripped him a new asshole. <laughs> like, what, you mean like maybe punch him in the face like the other one does? I, <laughs> I would have been Mira. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He's like just sitting there and, you know, eating biscuits and smiling and trying to fill this awkward silence because Violet's like not talking for, you know, two pages. But I do love the irony of this line. Brennan says, quote, a few days ago, I'm pretty sure I never get to watch you do, well, anything ever again. Brennan, <laughs> think before you speak, my guy, because she's felt that way for six years years. I love how Violet is more angry than she realizes. There's such a mix of emotions between being relieved that her brother's alive and being upset that he let her think that he was dead. And this whole book is Violet grappling with the aftermath of her world turning upside down. You know, knowledge is what grounds her. Knowledge is what's sacred to Violet. And now everything she thought she knew is a lie. And it shows in very big ways in this book, but also in just like little ways like this where she is more angry than she realizes. And she's just, again, processing so much throughout a lot of this book. We learn that Brennan has a new name, Lieutenant Colonel Aesirai, which means resurrection. We learn later that's what it means in Tirish. And with this new identity, he's hidden. No one in Poromiel knows who he is. The Assembly does, but I doubt most people in Arisha know that he is Brennan Sorengale. He's had to take on a new identity, and now he is someone new and in a position of power here in this revolution. There is a moment when they're at Uncle Takaris's house where he is addressed as Lieutenant Colonel Acerai, but then he says something about like as her brother or something to that effect and I don't know if that was just a oops <laughs> that might have been an oops <laughs> but that was a moment where it was like wait what? <laughs> like, who knows this? So it is fun to speculate who knows and who doesn't. There are a lot of mentions of how Bodhi closely resembles Zayden. It's throughout this entire book, but it's specifically here. Now, this could just be character development and descriptions, and like ease for us reader to be able to picture Bodhi. But it did really stand out to me on a reread. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine, and she was saying how in the second half of the book, when they're at Arisha, Bodhi is rarely mentioned. And she was wondering, she's like, is he off doing missions impersonating as Zayden? And yeah, so I'm curious. I want to know more about Bodhi because if that's the case... That would be a cool character development for our guy, Bodhi. That's interesting. I don't think that he's necessarily impersonating Zayden, but I think that there's going to be more emphasis on their bloodline. They're not necessarily royalty, but they are of aristocratic status here. And I believe that Rebecca is really drawing the line here between Bodhi and Zayden are related. And that's going to play a bigger role throughout the series moving forward. I think also we get a little bit more of Bodhi at Best Gaieth. And so it's just kind of trying to have I'll call it like a Zayden representative there for her, you know? So that's kind of how I saw it. It's really creating a bridge that these two characters are related. They're close. 
this is going to play a bigger role later on. Totally. There is that missive that Brennan gets with the blue wax seal. And you and I... (laughs) Spent so long <laughs> deciding who is this missive from, and we were firmly in it's from Professor Carr. Now, with the information that we now have in Iron Flame, Professor Carr is off the table. I am furious at that man. I cannot even tell you. <laughs> I know, like, oh man, I, we're, we'll definitely get to Professor Carr when we get to that part. But man, we thought this missive was so important. And it's like, clearly not. (laughs) Now, but it does make me wonder, who is this missive from still? And I'm leaning towards Devera. So I kind of got the impression during my first read that she was more of a silent sympathizer, that it was kind of like she was just waiting for her opportunity to rise up and join. I don't know if the missive would be from her. We know that there are people forging weapons at Biscayeth. They have a connection to a blacksmith or someone to that effect at Biscayeth. So my guess is that it's a little bit more related to that. We still don't fully know who is undercover at Biscayeth. At the end of part one, we do learn that there are a lot more people who are sympathetic than we might have realized, but not necessarily who were undercover previously. Yes, I agree. I think that there's definitely going to be like, it was not as important as we thought it was going to be. I thought I, I went through the book and like searched blue wax seal or even just the color yes. blue and couldn't find anything. <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe it's important. Maybe it's not. Maybe we'll get it in book three. We'll see. It's like, is it from the healer's quadrant because they're a blue shade? Or are, is it from the infantry? infantry? Exactly. They're navy blue too. So it's like, I don't think it is. I think that it's something that we just have to understand. It's from Biscayeth that they have a lot more people undercover there than we realize. And the story keeps moving on. <laughs> That's not good enough for fantasy fangirls. I need more. (laughs) Well, let's move on here to the assembly. First of all, I want to know more about them. Same. I want an entire book of the assembly. I do love that we get Major Ferris's name in this stretch, but Violet still calls him Hawknose for the rest of the book. We also get a petite woman whose hair is glossy. This is Trissa. We get a man with thick silver hair and a silver beard. This is Felix, my love. I love Felix. I can't wait to talk about him more. We get a blonde woman who's built like a battle axe. Her name is Battle Axe to our knowledge. And then we get Suri, who is just delightful. She's described as having a giant emerald ring. And the fact that this was pointed out, it's probably nothing, but you know me and my like parsing through this language. It's something to look out for. So keep that in mind. Giant emerald ring is... Sorry. I thought that as well when I saw that. It's like, ooh, I wonder what this could mean. We'll dive more into who these assembly members are and the limited info we know of them, which Nicole pretty much just recapped, but we'll go into it more in a later episode. But for now, we know that these are the five assembly members plus Brennan and Zayden. We learn later that Zayden is the seventh assembly member. I can't remember. Is Brennan an assembly member as well, which would mean then that all seven are present. There are seven total assembly members. They need five to be present together and four is a majority. So even though it's made to sound like not all seven are present at this time, I'm under the impression that they are because I think Brennan is one of the assembly members as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I got the exact same thing. So that's why it was like, I think that's why this was such a big deal because all seven were present so that's when you know like oh shit's going down right well I want to know where else like they're from like does everyone here live in Arisha or are they from some of the other areas in Tyrandor and they're like more I'll call it undercover there because remember the other cities of Tyrandor they were taken over by loyal Navarian families so I wonder if Hawknos and Suri and all of them are part of these other cities I don't know I don't think so I think that they really are all somehow situated in Arisha. I, again, I want to know more about these characters. Same. I want to know how they all got to this place right here. I want to know more. But until then, we do know one thing's for sure. They do not trust Violet. Oh, no, they do not. We hear a lot from the Assembly's discussion that we don't understand in this moment. Again, it's a lot of information gathering that us as the readers and Violet, we just tuck that information away for later because it's like, I know this is important. I don't understand it yet. Once when I have more context, this will all make make a lot more sense. And I love that little line, tuck away this information for later. It's so scribe. And I just love the way Violet thinks with that stuff. Now there is a moment in the assembly meeting where Brennan and Zayden share a look and it dawns on Violet that Zayden probably knows Brennan better than she does. And it's moments like this where it's like, 
Oh God, I sympathize so hard with Violet. Not only is her brother, who she's been mourning for six years, alive, but she's also talked to Zayden about him before she knew that he was actually alive. And Zayden knew the entire time. He said nothing, obviously, with his like selective truths stuff. How he wormed his way back into her life after this, I am shocked. I mean, not that I am one to talk. I would have caved fast but still the fact that like he was able to do that is just that that's impressive Zayden well done I like how Taryn responds to Violet when she's really him hawing over this that he's like what would you have done with this information and it's a very good point it does not excuse the fact that Zayden really chose some selective truths here but it does make sense of it's like what would she have done with this knowledge yes of course she had to eventually forgive him but man that is the big thing to have to forgive back to the assembly when one of the assembly members says that they should send all but quote unquote the two back to Beskyeth. I Which two are they talking about? I assume that they're talking about Zayden and Violet and them not being the ones to return back to Beskyeth. But is that what you understood as well? That's exactly what I understood. I Definitely Violet, no matter what, because I think that they were like, how do we make Violet stay here and not be a prisoner? But Suri's like, be a prisoner. The only other person I could think of with Zayden is like, you're about to graduate. You're the leader of the revolution. You gotta stay here, my guy. But just as I'm talking about how Zayden warned his way back into Violet's life. I want to swoon over Zayden for a moment. Quote, my life is equal to any of theirs. We learn and can gather based off of this commanding present in this room that he has that Zayden is actually the rightful leader of Eratia. Technically Duke, sort of, but the other guy was named Duke of Tyrandor when Eratia fell, as we learned from a epigraph by Cyrilla Nilwert later on in this book. But hearing him say that his life is equal to any of theirs, that is just such a good leader alert. Also saying, she, Violet, is worth a dozen of me, and I'm not talking about her signet. Just... <sighs> God, I love Zayden. I love him so much. I'm going to say that so much this book and I don't even care. Also, how did Zayden know that they were in the hall? I'm assuming his shadows or he had, you know, his intrinsic antenna up and he could hear probably Violet's thoughts or because I'm assuming Imogen and Bodhi have like shields locked into place at this point. But do they have their shields locked into place here at Arisha? I don't know if they would because probably. they are in a safe space. Like all of the things that they would have to shield from people, everybody else already knows about that. And nobody else knows that Zayden is an intrinsic, so they don't even know to shield out his thoughts here. I am under the impression that Zayden does not like to use his intrinsic ability for the people that he knows and loves. Like he's pretty clear about saying he's not going to use it with Violet. Now, whether he actually doesn't use it is another question, but he tries not to. I assume that the same extends to Bodhi, Imogen, Garrick, like the people who he's closest with, he has a sense yeah. of respect for their privacy. And more than anything, he already trusts them. So he doesn't need to know what their intentions are because he knows that they are on his side. They know that he can, yeah. he knows that he can trust them. Well, and there's also that moment later when we are at the uncle's house and Zayden is in the dining room. Kat, Violet, Mira, and Serena are all walking towards the dining room and Zayden could hear the conversation, quote unquote, hear the conversation happening out in the hall. Now that could be because of his shadows again, or it could be an intrinsic moment. I do wonder in that moment, was that him using his shadows or his intrinsic abilities? Can he use his shadows to sense other people or is it his intrinsic powers? I don't know. I'm going to lean shadows because again, kind of like people are hiding. It's, there's a little bit more of like that shadowy quality to it. So I'm going to go with door number one, shadows. I'm going to shock everyone and go door number two, intrinsic ability. Of course you are. <laughs> I do want to ask you, what do you think of this line? So Brennan mentions how Violet needs to be protected because if she dies, Zayden dies. And Violet thinks, quote, is that all I am to him, Brennan? Zayden's weakness? Do you think that he's actually thinking of her as a weakness or is he in like you know, super lieutenant colonel mode where he's in like plotting or what What do you think of this line? I, I think that he is definitely in that lieutenant colonel mode. Um, I think more than anything, it's a reflection on Violet and her insecurities because it's just a valid fact. It's not subjective or anything like that. It is a simple fact that she, her life is tethered to the leader of this revolution. That There's no way around that. And it is a tactical fact that needs to be considered with all things involving Violet and Zayden, right? But she is really insecure that she is nothing more than a lifeline for Zayden. That's yeah. really how she was feeling in the second half of Fourth Wing. And that's carrying over here as well. Because while, yes, it is a fact, of course she's more than that. Of course she is her own person 
person who should be kept alive just because she's a person and not just because of Zayden. And so I think that just because it is a fact that Brennan has to point out, it's much more of a reflection on her insecurity that that is all she is. And that's something that she's really having to come to terms with throughout this book in addition to in Fourth Wing too. I love that. I could not agree more with that answer. Yes. Felix already (laughs) stealing my heart. I love this man so much. In the Iron Flame like reactions episode, you actually compared Felix to my husband's best friend and our previous roommate. (laughs) I cannot see him any other way now. I know me too. In my head. Oh my God. I love it. So Violet is being just like absolutely eviscerated by the assembly, mainly Surrey, with words and and stuff like that. But Felix defends her in a way that it's almost, it's from a very teacher kind of a way. Not necessarily that he's teaching in that moment, but it's very like professor status. He's telling her that should she return, quote, Atos will not be among your friends. He will do everything he can to kill you for what you've seen. One, nope. Actually, when she does show Dane, what happens? He will come to their side, which is wild to me, and I cannot wait to get to those stretch of chapters. And secondly, Felix is already stepping in as a pro Violet guy. I fucking love Felix. He actually, he does kind of give me like Dumbledore vibes where he's like, I'm going to tell you what you need to know in that moment. I'm going to push you, but I'm also never going to make you feel less than. And I love that. Yes. I'm so excited to talk to, to get into the Felix side of things, but it's just fun. Like again, in a reread where it's like, oh, Felix from the get-go was pro-Violet here and he does become her mentor. He's not as prominent of a character in Iron Flame as I might have liked, especially in part two. And she's training with him and all of that, but I am excited to learn more about him and for him to really be her mentor when it comes to her lightning wielding here. It opens up so much more with what she can do with her power, right? And it makes me really disappointed in Professor Carr, but we will get to that when we get to that (laughs) stretch of chapters. Anyway, as we start our much needed info dump with Brennan, we learn... Brennan knew... That Violet crossed the parapet and survived her first year. Who was writing him? Who was giving him this information? Was it Zayden? Or was it this mysterious blue seal missive person that we are so hung up on? I don't think that it's like one particular person that he's getting all of his information from. I think that there is a whole underground network that they have. And yes, Zayden probably is a, a big factor in that. Remember, Emma Jin is also very familiar with Arisha. Bodhi is as well. Like, like people who are in her squad are coming to Arisha after threshing. So I'm sure that it's just kind of general knowledge and not one source of information there. We also learn Mira does not know that Brennan is alive. There was a lot of speculation about this, with most of us assuming that no, Mira didn't know. But maybe their mom does, which we sort of learn now and get confirmed later that she definitely did not know that Brennan was alive. When I read this section of the book, I was like, oh, Lilith knows. I was convinced. I absolutely was convinced that Lilith knew. And then I was laughably proven wrong later in this book when she like is horrified to learn that Brennan is alive. And let us not forget that in chapter one of Fourth Wing, it is described that she, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something along the lines of she tolerates Violet. She, you know, sees herself in Mira, but she loved Brennan. And for her to learn that Brennan is alive was just such a powerful moment. And I'm glad she didn't know. I'm In hindsight, I'm so glad she didn't know. I am too. And it's so funny that you read it as, oh, this means that Lilith did know. I read this as, oh, okay, I think that this means that Lilith doesn't know that he is alive. So we do learn that Marb is Brennan's dragon. He's an orange dagger tail, which I want to talk about the color orange of dragons later, but that is very much on my radar of whose dragons are orange. But Marb in Scottish Gaelic and in Irish as well means dead which is pretty on the money. (laughs) But it also makes me wonder, is that future foreshadowing or is that looking backwards at the past as we should we thought that Brennan was dead I'm leaning towards the latter I think it definitely is a reflection on him having died and then of course his name means resurrection as well so it just goes hand in hand there when her and Brennan are talking he goes like whoa 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 one question at a time and he puts his hands up like he's you know in trouble basically like put your hands up and Violet notices a rune shaped scar on Brennan's palm 
what could this be? In our Q&A with our Patreon members, we speculated this for a little bit as well. There is a a lot of evidence that this could be the rune that resurrected Brennan. So maybe Naolin crafted this rune and pressed it into Brennan's palm. However, later on in runes class, Professor Lucera is teaching them how to weave runes. She weaves a rune in the air. She describes this is how you create one. You decide when and how long it's going to be activated for. And then she places her palm on a wooden board and that's how the rune gets actually activated. So another thing I'm thinking is, could this rune on Brennan's palm be a non-activated rune that is like ready to roll when he places it in something? That's so interesting. I love thinking about this. So I thought of it as more of a scar from a rune that was already used. I'm going to go ahead and pull the line here of what we're talking about. One at a time, he, Brennan, holds up his hands like he's under attack, and I glimpse a ruin-shaped scar on his palm before he grips the edge of the table. Naolin, he was his jaw flexes, unquote. I don't think it's a coincidence that this description is stated in the middle of their nail and resurrecting him conversation. <laughs> That's not a coincidence. No. <laughs> so while we don't know exactly what this ruined scar is from or what it's for, my guess is that it happened or was activated during that battle, whether it was the reason that Brennan was killed or it helps him stay alive. I think that it was something that had to do with him being resurrected. I definitely could see this being the rune that someone, most likely Naolin, pushed, like activated within Brennan, and that was the resurrection rune, for lack of a better term. Now, it does make me wonder, can someone burn out and maybe channel from the source, which we'll talk more about in a second, when they're weaving runes? Like, is that how it gets really complicated? I don't I, know. Like, as I was saying, because I originally, I really did think that this rune scar was what helped him resurrect. But you're right. Naolin, he burned out from siphoning, or he pulled that power from the source. Again, we'll talk about that here in a second. So I don't know if ruins would even have anything to do with that in that situation. So maybe it is actually not activated yet and it's something that will be. Or maybe it's something to do with protecting him, you know, like how the rebellion relics and how that is actually protecting all of them from Colonel Mari's ruins. So maybe it's something to that effect. Oh, I like that idea too. There's so many possibilities. And I know that that was not just a throwaway line. Like we will learn more about that later books. Absolutely. The way that Brennan exclaims that Violet did have their dad, even though they didn't have Brennan anymore, it gives us a sense of confirmation that their dad wasn't pretending to be dead and actually part of the revolution as well. There was a lot of speculation on maybe he faked his death and he's actually now with the revolution, that he was teaching Brennan all about the stuff about the revolution and that's what made Brennan turn over. But from this point, none of that's the case. I think it's pretty straightforward here. TPD, if their dad is a Venon, I can't believe I'm even entertaining this theory. <laughs> if you listen to our fourth wing episodes, I was very adamant about people not being Venon and all that is out the window now. So I'm still convinced, however, that Violet and Brennan's dad is not a Venon, but who knows anything anymore? So I am just so firmly in the camp that Papa Sorengale was killed by leadership. And I mean, Me killed, not Venonified by leadership, killed. It's too perfect. Like Lilith saying, I'll see him soon at the end of the book. Just like, Oh my God, it's heartbreaking. However, there is an incredibly popular theory out there on the interwebs by Claudia Carlucci, and I'm going to link her TikToks in the show notes. Claudia mentions that in the epigraph for chapter 66, it says, quote, we have tried every method we know of as you requested. There is no cure. There is only control, unquote. This is a missive from Lieutenant Colonel Nolan to General Lilith Soringale. Now, on first read, I was like, oh, this is about Jack. However, Nolan, as Claudia mentions, Nolan in our story's timeline is a colonel, not a lieutenant colonel. Uh huh. <laughs> so in chapter oh 25, God. it stated Colonel Nolan. Um, if you wanted a chapter timestamp, yes, I searched my entire ebooks high and low. It is in there. But this letter says Lieutenant Colonel. So Lieutenant Colonel is the step below Colonel. So that means it would be from the past, which means either it's not about Jack and it's about someone totally different, or it is about Jack and he was promoted midway through the Jack stuff. But that doesn't feel right. Absolutely not. What if this is about a different Venon, not Jack, a different Venon that Lilith wanted cured, but they weren't able to because as the missive says, there is only control. 
However, the plot thickens. So at Make It Faye on Instagram, which by the way, you all have tagged us in all these theory videos. Thank you so freaking much. You are all amazing. Make It Faye mentioned that in chapter one of Fourth Wing, we get the quote, Lilith had a fever when she was pregnant with Violet. What if it wasn't a fever? What if she was drained either by herself and she's the Venon or by Violet's father, who is Venon and she was trying to save him by finding a cure. Lieutenant Colonel Nolan was not able to find a cure. He only found control. Now, here's my thoughts on these theories. I don't think it was Violet's father. I'm, I'm, I'm so firmly in the camp that Violet's father is dead just because it's so perfect. It's too perfect for the story. Now, we were also firmly in the camp of a lot of things that we now have big eggs on our faces, so who knows? But my question is, what if Lilith was asking about herself because Violet's hair has the color drained from it, no matter how short she cuts it. So there's a lot of, you know, venom, violet crossover, but what if it's from Lilith instead? I have not, I, this is all new information to me. <laughs> like I am just flabbergasted right now. So, okay. So first of all, absolutely brilliant on catching that Lieutenant Colonel Nolan versus Colonel Nolan. Fantastic. Well done, Claudia. Yeah, right. Well done. What if the Venom that did get Lilith, a lot of us fans are in the camp that Lilith's fever when she was pregnant with Violet is definitely from a Venom. Now, how it's from a Venom, we all kind of differ on our theories with that, but the idea here is that it's definitely from a Venom. What if they caught the Venom that did get her and they're trying to find a cure, they're trying to find control and something to that effect. So it's not necessarily that it's, but no, because they are wanting to find that cure. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't think it it's their dad who is a venom and they're trying to cure him or whatnot. But I do think that this right here really illustrates how long leadership has known and had venom that they're experimenting on that Jack is absolutely not the first, right? And in fact, I bet he's not the first because they know the telltale signs. They are watching on that mat there. <gasps> what if Professor Emeterio, I bet you more people than we think turn venom on the mat because like they're having to suddenly start channeling. They are in a fight or die situation and they're, they still don't have control over their power, right? And a lot of them are very power hungry like Jack. So what if Professor Emeterio is almost like keeping an eye on people because they know that they need to pull them for those experimentations? I'm going to stir the pot a little bit deeper. Are you ready for it? So I was on Instagram this morning and someone tagged us in a video. I don't remember the name of the account, but I will put it in the show notes. When in Fourth Wing, we meet Dylan, who rip my guy Dylan. He did not get the time he deserved. But it's described as him looking so young and he having blonde hair. Later on in Iron Flame, when we get the big venom fight at Bezgaeth, she faces, she, Violet, faces off with a venom who is young, too young, and has blonde hair. So what if leadership is also taking cadets who fall early before threshing or hell at this point, maybe even after threshing and venonifying them, but not curing them and only controlling them and like making them a part of their army. I don't know. There's so much I'm here. I am of the belief that Rider Quadrant cadets are turning venon more often than we assume, or maybe even other people too, like after they graduate. And the way of trying to control them is... First of all, trying to find a cure. That's step number one. And when they can't find a cure, then they try to control them. And they're always doing these experiments on them. And then like with what Colonel Atos does, then he, he uses controlling them for assassination attempts, for instance. There's uh. so much here. I'm... <laughs> Speaking of Venon, we have to ask the question, is Naolin a Venon or is he dead? Yes, he's Venon. <laughs> In our reactions episode, Nicole and I were very much on the Naolin is a Venom train. And while I'm definitely still leaning this way, because of the way losing him is discussed in this book. Like when Taryn says with a rough voice to Violet, quote, we will no longer speak of the one who came before. It could be as simple as he's still mad that Naolin let himself burn out and die. And that's why Taryn is extra sensitive to Violet risking burnout multiple times. Or it's not because he knows what happened to Nalen and like it just doesn't sit well. He is so angry about what happened. So in the assembly meeting, Brennan says, quote, knowing that she's bonded to Taryn, whose bonds get deeper with each writer and whose previous bond was already so strong that Nalen's death nearly killed him. Death. That's not very cryptic. However, I think he was lying to the assembly because later he says Nalen didn't fail, but it cost him everything. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But 
that's not adding up. So taking a step back, the biggest question is, if Naolin is still technically alive and he is a Vannon, what does that mean for his bond with Taryn? Because the dragon bond, it did not break for Jack and Bade, and it did not break for Segale and Zayden. At least we assume that Segale has not reached for Zayden or talked to him since the battlefield where he turned, but they are definitely still bonded. I'll get to that way later. Are we sure it didn't break for Jack and Bade? Because Jack killed Bade and he still lived. So that seems to me like their bond was broken. I didn't think about that. Taryn was saying that Bade has been keeping a secret from them, from all of them, that Jack was still alive. But you're right. Maybe Bade was more like wallowing in self-pity. <laughs> <laughs> very Grinch of you. I Or like maybe the bond is just very different. I mean, obviously a bonded can kill their dragon and still live. Because they're no longer tethered to that power. They're tethered to another kind of power as well. God, this makes me so nervous for Zayden and Sigale. But okay, so, but here's the other thing too, is that Zayden is still able to use his signet powers in that last POV. And he can only use his signet powers that he received from Sigale from channeling with her power. So I really do True. think that Sigale and Zayden are absolutely still bonded. That is a great point of about Jack and Bade. But back to Taryn and Naolin. If Naolin did turn Venom, that means that Taryn probably broke the bond himself. I don't know how that's possible, but he probably did. Or if Naolin ventured further into, let's call it Venonhood, remember, there's different levels of turning Venon. And there's like the certain, like there's no going back point where the dragon bond breaks. Maybe that happened with Jack. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the more you channel from the source, the weaker your dragon bond gets. Considering Zayden only did it once, for now, which is terrifying to say, his bond with Sigale would still be, I would assume, fairly strong. But we're assuming that Jack's been doing this a lot. Not are so much we? to the point, though. Well, I'm assuming, but his eyes are still sometimes red, sometimes not, which we know from that epigraph that sometimes the lowest level of venom, their eyes, their red eyes go in and out based off of how often they quote unquote feed. Which which goes back to Zayden's being almost indistinguishable, which means he only kind of towed the line there, so to speak. But that's what makes me think like if Naolin is not a low level venom, what if he's a sage or a maven, aka the generals, like if he's one of those higher level venom, then that I would assume that bond would be absolutely eviscerated at that point. But it would but that would take a lot of time. And the bond breakage with Terran, it might not have been absolutely immediate, but it was definitely very it, it happened very quickly. I like your idea about Taryn breaking it. I think I think you're on the money with Taryn breaking the bond because he was betrayed by Naolin. Yep. That's my But opinion. then that goes back to, I don't know if Bade would have broken the bond because Bade was kind of a... Bade's insane. Bade would not have broken the bond. Bade is fucking crazy. Orange, orange dragon. There's another one. Just to point <laughs> it out. We also know nothing about a body for Naolin. And we all, meaning me, learned our lesson from Jack. Brennan woke up on a nearby cliff. Where did Naolin's dead body go? How did Brennan get there? There's lots of questions here that we'll also be getting into here in a moment. And while it's not really like a sign pointing to Naolin being a Venon, I do want to point something else out. We don't know what he looks like, and I think that it's safe to assume that Violet doesn't either for the most part. Would she recognize Naolin as a Venon? For instance, if he was a sage and he was up there on the battlefield, would she recognize him? I don't think she would, but I can guarantee you that Taryn definitely would. So there's a lot of people who are speculating that Naolin was a sage and at the fourth wing battle. I do not believe that. I do think that Naolin, if he is a Venon, which I do think he is, that he is like one of those higher ups, like a sage or something. But I do not think that we have seen him yet because Taryn, no matter what, would have known that it was him. Another potential Venon hint, how Brennan says that Naolin didn't fail, referring to how he saved Brennan's life, but it cost him everything. Now, this could easily mean everything just means his life because that is a pretty big thing. Or it could mean his soul is this everything, which is exactly what happens when you turn Venon. It cost him everything. It cost him his soul. It cost him being a person. So later in the book, Lyra in her journal, this is another epigraph, which I love how many epigraphs we get in this book. It's really fun to parse them through all together. At some point, I want to make just a document of every single epigraph from Fourth Wing and Iron Flame and like connect the books. Is that a thing already? One of our Discord members already created it, at least for Iron Flame. And so it is actually in our Discord available to us. I 
love our discord so much. You guys are the best. Thank you for everything you do. It makes me so happy. But in this epigraph from Lyra in her journal, it says, quote, I am alone in thinking the knowledge of the wards, the protections they provide should not solely benefit Navarre. And it has cost me everything. This is the chapter 63 opening, which we all know chapter 63 is a very, very important chapter. It's where we get the huge Andarna download. It's where Lilith dies, everything. So this is similar language to cost me everything cost him Naolan everything now does this mean she's also a venom based off of the wording and what she's talking about here I don't think so but what is this similar phrasing or is this just a saying you know because cost me everything is a saying that we say in the modern language and nothing else maybe but it's fun to see those two parallels that's not interesting. Yeah. There's definitely something more to nail. And like it's – we've just seen like the surface level about what happened with him and the way that it keeps appearing in this book. Now, I do want to play devil's advocate here. <laughs> I'm wondering if Naolin really did die and his story keeps popping up because it's meant to be a cautionary tale for those other writers who hold such great power, including Sloane, who becomes a siphon as well. It's definitely some foreshadowing for our characters in the present day, whether he's alive or not alive. And yet, I just can't shake this feeling that there is key information about Naolin that we don't know yet. And that is why we feel kind of unsatisfied with what we're hearing right now from Brennan's download. There's a whole iceberg below this surface level information we know right now. And that is exactly why I think it makes him a Venon and that he's one of these sage Venon right now, that there is going to be a really big reveal regarding Naolin in the future. I just want to point out that if he is Venon, which I'm very much in Venon camp, Imagine him and Taryn facing off on the battlefield. No, That's going to be that insane. Crazy? Oh, I'm so excited. I want to point out one little theory, and I'm going to keep this really short because we've been tagged in it a lot, that Naolin is Brennan and Violet's dad. His age is never said, so we could. We might be jumping to conclusions thinking he's around Brennan's age, but there are theories saying that he is Violet and Brennan's dad. I would assume then also Mira's dad. But there's a lot of reasons I'm not buying into this theory, more of which we'll talk about in just a second. I'm very much in the camp that their dad was their dad. A lot of people are thinking, oh, it's their dad is somebody else. I firmly believe that their dad is their dad, that he and Lilith did love one another, and that he was killed by leadership. I think it's a yep. little bit more straightforward than a lot of us are thinking. <laughs> it's funny because um, a year ago, that wasn't straightforward. A year ago, that was like, oh, oh my God. But now after all of our theorizing and parsing through this text, it does feel very straightforward. But that just feels so cemented and right to the story and where we think it's going. Yes. Now let's talk about Brennan's story because – I have a lot of things that I need to say about this. Once again, we have only gotten the tip of the iceberg with Brennan's story about how Naolin saved him, but it cost him everything. And I am left with still so many questions. For one, did Finn Ryerson really strike a would-be killing blow to Brennan? We have no idea. Like we discussed above, did Naolin turn Venon? The explanation was a little cryptic, so maybe we're thinking too much into it. I really don't think so, but there's that question too. Another question, what's the timeline of Brennan turning against Navarre and siding with the revolution? This kind of goes right back to, did Finn Ryerson actually try to kill him? It sounds like Brennan was on the Navarian side, and then like at the very last second, or kind of like after he was saved and he just kind of woke up in Arisha, you know, like Stockholm Syndrome, where he became... <laughs> part of <laughs> where, he, where he then joined the revolution. That's very unclear still. And I, of course, I have new questions also after hearing the story. How did he wake up on a cliffside? Presumably away from where he fell in what we think was battle. Again, did Finn Ryerson you know, maybe try to kill him or was he trying to save him and he helped him get to this cliffside and that's when he was captured? Did Mar Brennan's wounded dragon get him to this cliffside? Did Naolan drop him off here before running away to go become a Venon? I think that Brennan woke up on this cliffside near Ryerson House before Arisha was burned and then that is when they stayed hidden in the caves while it was torched and then after it was torched, that's where they met up with the civilians who survived it. Another question, was his dragon wounded by another dragon? How did the Empyrean feel about this human civil war where the dragons had to fight dragons? I think there were not Venon and Wyverns in this vicinity here. So if his dragon was wounded, which dragon wounded him? Or was it a crossbow? Or how was his dragon wounded if it was not from a Venon, Wyvern, or Griffin? And 
let's talk about other dragons. What? There are other dragons here. Who saved, quote unquote, us? Who is us that Brennan is referring to? Is it other Navarians who turn for the revolutionary side? Are the assembly members part of this us? Other Tyrandor rebellion fighters who evade capture and execution? Again, maybe it's the assembly members. What else is in this network of caves besides apparently Solus later on? I just like have so many questions about this. <laughs> I literally have written into the outline, Nicole does shrug emoji. I have <laughs> no idea. All of these are such good questions and I wish we had answers for them. But I wouldn't even know where to speculate on a lot of these questions. And I hope we just get a full on like princess tale moment for Brennan so we can understand what's going on. And I do think that is highly probable that we will get something like that. Here's one thing I will say with very high, high, high amounts of certainty. Naolin was something more to Brennan. And Violet actually literally says those exact words. And she speculates, I think, that he was something more to Brennan. Moments like that is exactly what makes me absolutely not believe the Naolin equals their father figure line. Little tells like his jaw ticks when he's talking about Naolin. And then later when she's like, what about you? Are you married? Kids? Da 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 da. He says, no partner, no kids, point made. Partner is a very intentional word there. Now, to be fair, I call Brett my or I called Brett my partner for years back when he was still my boyfriend and I absolutely refused to call him boyfriend because that was just so not what he was to me. He was partner. But this wording here feels very intentional. And again, it's representation without representation being shoved in our face. And I freaking love it. I'm here for Brennan being gay. I love this. I really hope that this is true. I absolutely, like, especially after seeing this, a lot of us speculated that he and Naolin were lovers. And this, to me, was like 99% confirming that. Yeah, same. It is very concerning how Violet knows more about Venon and Wyvern than Brennan and the Revolution. I have the same <laughs> like, thought. This is wild. Brennan confirms that they've only known about Wyvern for a few months. They don't know where they're originating. In fact, they thought that they hatched, not created by the Venon. And this is like Nicole just said, this is wild, like just wild. Have the Venon only just started using Wyvern as they invade poor meal, or are they using them way more often and in bigger numbers? I bet that they are able to create more Wyvern as they gain more power and invade poor meal. The more that they're sucking the land of its magic, they're then partially using it to create their Wyvern army. That's got to be why this is a relatively new development. Brennan also doesn't know that Venon are teaching each other. He also has kept the cadets in the dark to protect their safety, which he admits may have been a mistake. Kind of like how if Zayden told Violet about them earlier, she could have armed the crew with knowledge about the Venon. The fact that they have been dicking around for six years, six years, and Violet comes in and gives them like, all of this info dump and they're like we were just gonna fight this with daggers she's like you can activate a wardstone you can do this Vi wyvern are made not born or hatched or whatever he's like the way my jaw hit the floor when i was reading this for the first time i said it in battle brief i'm gonna say it again what the fuck were they doing before violet came along this is ridiculous so i i think also that it really shows that all of these writers have pretty limited perspective here even brennan who is just described multiple times throughout Fourth Wing as a brilliant strategist. And Violet has a scribe's mind. And so when she hears, oh, we have a dormant wardstone, she's like, well, then we have to go and search out the information to activate it. And that doesn't even cross anybody else's mind. And same thing with Venon and how her brother is like, oh, wow, you were actually listening to dad when he was telling us all these stories. It's like, Unforgivable. Yeah. I just, yeah, th this whole thing was just like, wow, you all really don't know very much. And it also does go to show, however, how secretive the Venon have been. And there's like, poor Emil knows so much more, but they're not talking to the revolution like they should be. There is just a lot of miscommunication here among everybody on the continent. <laughs> This is unforgivable. The fact that Violet faced off with one of the Venon on the back of Tarn knows all of this information. Like, maybe, sorry, look, I got a note for her. Why not instead of verbally attacking her and being like, this Sorengale is not very trustworthy, meh. Why not sit her down in the assembly meeting and being like, what did you learn from that Venon who you 
had a chat with. You just grabbed some coffee on the back of Taryn. Why don't we talk to you about what you learned in that? Like, I know that Zayden later is like, no scribes. We don't have any scribes in this revolution. They fucking need a scribe is what this is telling me. This is unforgivable. I cannot believe this. I'm heated. (laughs) Oh, man. We can joke about how frustrating this is, but it really does, just from a literary perspective, just show how, I don't even know the words for it. It just shows how disoriented everybody really and truly is no matter how much they're trying it really just goes to show how little everybody knows about venom and the fact that her dad was reading her these stories just from when she was young is huge and again i think that that does mean that their dad knew more than he would let on that brennan just did not ever catch either so brennan thinks that they have about six months until the venom are knocking down their store Hey, Nicole, isn't that how long this book is? The way I read this when I was first reading this for the the first time. Again, I read this in one sitting midnight premiere. I freaked the fuck out when I read this for the first time. And I thought for sure I was going to be right with them hearing from the Venon and how they breached the wards and all that kind of stuff. And that was going to be the cliffhanger at the end of Iron Flame. And Oh, how naive I was, how optimistic I was considering where this book actually ended. Oh man, I know, right? We need to pull out this line about Resin being the exception to the Venon's pattern of moving northwest toward Navarre, plus the location about an hour east of Resin, which has to be the other village they flattened a few days before heading to Resin, remember? Is this other village, Jana, where the other box was found and already destroyed? I really do wish this map was more detailed. I said that in Fourth Wing. I'm saying it again here for Iron Flame. Fourth Wing did not specify the name of this village, so I'm going to just assume that it is Jana. This is all confirming that the Venon were lured to these two outlier locations, assumably by Colonel Atos. Lured? How, you ask? That iron box from the clock tower that they were trying to get. This lure was a little anticlimactic, I'll I'm going to say for now. This lure is anticlimactic for now. I think that these boxes are going to play a way bigger role soon. And so yes. So it had to be destroyed before it could be fully investigated. But they could tell that these boxes were made in Navarre. And so Violet wonders what reason Navarre has to build these lures besides having them targeted at Resin. I believe that we can assume this type of venom lure is not unique only to Resin. Jack later uses his own lures, but are they the same as this? I kind of assume so how else would he be able to get to them unless venon like smuggled these lures into biscaya i think that these lures whether they're all boxes or whatever they are i think these lures are already in biscaya and that is how jack was able to then distribute them out so he was just using what navar already had to his disposal to then help the venon which i think is really interesting because now there's multiple uses from both the navar side for luring the venon in to target people that they don't like and the venon use them as well to to lure the Venn in there to target this guy. So do you think that Jack is the one planting the boxes? I took this as someone in leadership is either planting the boxes or someone is venom and planting the boxes, the boxes almost as like a follow the leader or like a Jack and Jill like breadcrumb situation for the other venom. Yeah, I was under the impression it was Jack because Dane is able to find out where the location is for most of those boxes. Now, keyword is most of those boxes. So maybe Jack was just planting most of them and then someone else planted the other ones. My understanding, however, is that Dane just wasn't able to get the entire the full download. He got like the 90% download before it cut off. Oh, I forgot about that. Yep, so. you're right. Fucking Jack. <laughs> then we have the question about how much Violet and Brennan's father knew. Again, one of our big questions heading into this book. We've already kind of talked about it, but let's wrap this up. We only get speculation in which his children hope he didn't know about what was going on. Violet doesn't want to believe that their dad withheld this big bit of info. However, I... I personally don't think many of us view it in the same way that she does here. Are are you thinking the same thing as I am? We think he was trying to tell her in his coded ways because he wasn't able to outright say it for obvious reasons. And she's not even considering this as a possibility right now. She did back at Athbane in Fourth Wing before the battle when all these pieces were falling into place and she was thinking about his book of fables and his letter and they were major pieces to the puzzle. But right here, she just feels like her father was lying to her her whole life and I disagree with that I disagree entirely as well because it is so obvious to me that he's like children read between the lines now obviously Brennan was a dingledorf and didn't like the fact that him 
I, I can only assume Mira as well, were just like oblivious and didn't remember anything. And yet he's a lieutenant colonel in the revolution. I will never get over this. That is ridiculous to me. Well, so just thinking about it as like being siblings, right? So he and Mira are much closer than Violet was just because she's the younger, like she's six years younger than Mira, who's the second oldest. We can assume that Mira and Brennan are about three to four years apart. So I think that Mira and Brennan, they were the writers. They were much more of a duo. And then there was Violet, who was almost kind of left behind and their father kind of took her under his wing. I, I mean, she naturally gravitated towards books and the scribe put anyway. But I think that it it's not surprising that she comprehended a lot more than Brennan did because he considered it much more of just stories that his dad was telling him when he wanted to go run off and do other things. Well, for her, it was like her Bible, yeah. you know? So okay. fine. I guess you're right. That'll satiate me for now. I got to defend Brennan here. Like, man, you are really on the Brennan hate train. Because <laughs> I'm the younger sibling and I will die for my younger siblings. <laughs> so uh, we do get confirmation from Brennan in this Brennan download that the sage at Resin did get away. So all of Lexi and I's counting of how many Venon there were, I think this is confirmation that there were either six or seven Venon on the higher end. Wait, I took this as there were God five. Damn it. <laughs> we're not open. This can of worms. We're not doing it today. We're never going to know how many venom there were in that battle. Honestly, I just need to accept that and move on. But we do see the sage later in this book. But is it the same sage? Is there only one or are there several? I'm leaning several. There's numerous sage. In the chapter 47 epigraph, it says sages, multiple. Yes, absolutely. There are multiple sages. And I don't know, but I bet that Naolin is one of them. We've already kind of talked about that. But yes, there are absolutely multiple sages. One of them got away and it helped us learn that there are multiple. Do you think Naolin is a sage or a maven? I think he's a sage. I don't think he's old enough. He hasn't been a venon long enough to be a good general. Point, good point. Good point. So last thing yeah. on this Brennan stuff before we move on to dragon mode, Lexi's favorite mode. Violet. Coming in with the logic. I'm going back on my Violet train, but for different reasons. She says, quote, you think you're going to win this war with a bunch of daggers? Thank you. In fourth wing in our deep dive, I was irate that they were just focusing on daggers and that's it. And Brennan here is like, we just need to forge more weapons. That's how we're going to win this war. And she's using logic and her scribe smarts. Where would the knowledge of these wards be? How to activate a ward? And Brennan is like, no. Just weapons, meh. Like, it's just, it drives me insane. But this shows how different Violet is. She is the, like, Hannah Montana, best of both worlds of scribe and writer. And that is why she's our heroine. And I love it. You get the best. Hannah Montana? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I was a little too old for Hannah Montana, but sounds Maybe good. <laughs> I'm the older sibling. Man, I'm going to protect Brendan at all costs. <laughs> I just think. I think he deserves a little bit more credit for what he's been doing for the last. He six hasn't years. been doing shit for six years in my mind. He's been just. I am wholeheartedly I'm just the with that. I'm just starting the pot at this point. <laughs> We're finally at the point. Oh my gosh, how long have we been already talking and we haven't even gotten to page 16? Stop. <laughs> which she goes to her dragons. I'm so excited. Now let's talk about everything with Andarna. Can you hear Lexi just like salivating into the microphone? <laughs> She's so I'm so excited. So my big question <laughs> off the bat is why do you think Sigail never liked Brennan? He says, quote, She's never liked me. So here's my theory. It had to do with Naolin, Taryn's previous writer. I, I don't think that Sigail likes Brennan. First of all, it's also noted that she just doesn't like anybody, which I do think that's definitely a part to play here. But we have to remember that Naolin had the bond with Taryn. And so technically, he was also bonded to Sigail in that you know, pattern kind of way. I don't think, however, that he that Naolin and Sigail really talked to each other, kind of like how Zayden and Taryn didn't talk to each other until Violet entered the picture. But again, she might not like Brennan because he is the reason Taryn almost died since Naolin sacrificed himself for Brennan. So she might just be on the Brennan hate train because he kind of almost killed her partner. Now, he does say she's never liked me. I'm assuming Brennan has interacted with Sigil before the Battle of Erasia. So I also wonder, again, supporting Brennan and Naolin being lovers, was he, Brennan, a distraction for Naolin and therefore a distraction for Taryn's writer? And that was another reason why she didn't like him. Possibly. I never I thought of that I just thought that was a very way. interesting line and I wanted to pull it. We get confirmation. Okay, so now back to Andarna. <laughs> 
we get confirmation that Indarna grew so fast from all the energy she used to stop time. Violet feels the weight of guilt that this is her fault, but Taryn assures her that it would have happened eventually. His biggest concern is getting Indarna back to the veil so she can sleep uninterrupted. I have a bone to pick with Zayden's description from Fourth Wing. <laughs> that Andarna is fucking huge. We were all speculating that Andarna would now be close to Sagale size or something to that effect. But she's not. She's about twice as big as she used to be, but that's not even close to Sagale or Terran size. Like this line just, it really threw us all off in fourth wing how we were then speculating. And yes, she is larger, but not that much bigger. Come this on. This is just another example of Zayden Ryerson leaving out information again, even Brennan, even Brennan is like, quote, Ryerson left out some details when he reported in this morning. My guess is that because he wanted this to be a big moment for Violet and her dragons, he he didn't want this to involve him. So I respect that. I respect him wanting her to figure this out. These are her dragons. Like he understands that bond as well as any other writer. But at least a clue would have been nice, Zayden. Like if I was Violet, I would have been like, the fuck, my guy? Like you could have weighed in that something was off. And like, I would have come here sooner. But I just love that Zayden was like, mm, I'm going to let her figure this one out. It's very Zayden. It's hers to figure exactly. out too, right? I bet that Taryn had something to do with, you better keep your mouth shut, Zayden. The big reveal here is that Andarna is no longer golden. <gasps> but she's black? Or is she so black that she shimmers purple? Almost iridescent? <laughs> We do later figure out that she is a chameleon or she's like iron color. We'll be speculating on all of that way later. And I just love all the hints that we get throughout this book that she, that Andarna is reflecting the colors of what's around her. But for now, she wants to be like Taryn, so she's I black. I love her. RIP to our golden dragon tattoos. I'm still in the camp. I know I was like horrifically against getting them, but now I'm like so married to the idea. I might make a petition for us to get our dragon tattoos. And just get like what a black no, dragon tattoo? No, get like a little golden or... one, just because it's like fourth wing. It would just be a fourth wing. No, it can't be. Uh, I... Maybe <laughs> no, I, we lost it. I'm sorry, it's lost. It's lost its luster wow. for me. Okay, fine. We'll just do our Harry Potter tattoos in December then. <laughs> Yeah, that was already planned. Now, Violet learning about Andarna. If I were Violet, this moment. It would be like a straw that broke the camel's back for me. Like she has been left in the dark from Zayden, Tarn, her brother. And this would just be like the one person. Like we keep on bringing back this moment in Fourth Wing when she, Violet, learns that Mira actually is alive at the end of the Montserrat battle. And she runs to her safe haven, which is Andarna. And her and Andarna have this special connection that is even more cemented at the end of this book when we get like this prof level info dump from Andarna and I'm so excited to talk about it but that moment for again I just really sympathize with Violet in the first half of this book of just how much she's been left in the dark and she's trying to grasp onto reality and then she walks up to her dragon who she is like this is my number one comfort and she's a different size and a different color than she was the last time she saw her I just I really really sympathize with Violet in this moment even though she's like not hurt necessarily uh, if putting myself in Violet's shoes I would have been I hear what you're saying I don't know if hurt is the right word I think that just surprised and Taryn even comforts her where he's like it would have happened anyway like of course she's not golden anymore she's growing up like that's just it's just what happens and it's almost like Violet just she does know that she knows that as a fact you know it's kind of like when you're looking at pictures of your kid when they're all tiny and little and then you look at them next to you and it's like oh my gosh you're so big and it's like your heart kind of hurts because you don't want them to be big because you always want them to be little like how you know them but it's just a fact of life you know I don't know that feeling personally I do have that when I look at your kids though because they're just so damn cute and I love them so much <laughs> I'm biased yeah. though it's okay I think they're really cute too <laughs> you're the most biased though but I might be biased as well. Yeah. <laughs> Violet speculates that Andarna has a Morningstar tail, but Taryn says that they form based on the dragon's choice and needs. Oh, I love it. So we don't get confirmation, but I am assuming that Andarna still has her feather tail in this scene. It turns into a poison scorpion tail during her dreamless sleep, or at least that's when we learn about her scorpion tail from Violet. So again, we can assume right now that it is not a poison scorpion tail. It will be once we reach that part. And right now it is still a feather tail. So excited. I do love the connection 
between the Taryn saying it's a dragon's choice and need. Now, obviously, riders cannot choose their signets necessarily, but they do get their signets based on what they need the most or who they are at their very core, which will be a huge theme for us as we go through this book and speculate what Violet's second signet is. Like, what does she need? Who is she at her core? But I love that's mirrored in the dragons as well as they choose their tail. I love that as well. And we will get all into why Andarna chose that. We have a really great excerpt from Rebecca, but now is not the time to go into that. Also, Brennan makes a comment that he's never seen such accelerated growth in a dragon before. Okay, first of all, no one at Biscayeth, to our knowledge, has seen a dragon grow whatsoever. So can we assume that because there are other dragons in this valley, which again, I have questions about, where the original hatchling grounds of Terran's line are, does that mean that there are dragons still hatching here? And maybe the secret of dragon hatchlings aren't so important here because the humans have quote unquote proved that they're trustworthy because you know, like they're not just trying to hold themselves up with awards. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that there are hatchlings here because there's emphasis on the dragons protecting and Darna in particular at all costs. So it could be a throwaway line about how he's never seen such accelerated growth, or it could mean that there are dragons hatching somewhere outside the veil, outside the wards, maybe here, or at least somewhere that Brennan has seen. You know what would have been really nice, Lex? Papa Soren Gale's Papa research. Papa Soren Gale's huh? fucking research <laughs> right about now. The fact that Violet hears this and experiences this situation and does not immediately think about her father's research on Feather Tales, that she knows where it is, that is wild to me that she did not immediately, like natural thought process, wild to me that she did not immediately go there. It would have been nice to have Papa Soren Gale's research, but here we are, researchless. <laughs> Pissed. That's going to be a common theme for us in this book, too. Where is his research? Uh-huh. <laughs> so Brennan's feelings towards Lilith. I need to know what happened at the Battle of Aratia. Because when Brennan says things like, quote, say, this is right after Violet was like, mom wouldn't you know, send me to my death. He says, quote, say that again. And this time, try to convince yourself that you mean it. The general's loyalties are so crystal fucking clear that she might as well have a tattoo. Yes, there are venom. Now go back to class on her forehead. How did he and his mother leave things to the point where he is so capital C convinced that she is evil? She is the devil reincarnate in his mind, it sounds like. And she would just send Violet off to Athbeen. Because she sent him off to go fight in Aresha. He was a dragon rider. For a war that... He, he was graduated. He was a lieutenant. True. However, it's all, he is so angry because he was lied to as well. He felt like he was on a battlefield. He was risking his life and everybody else around them as well. They were risking their lives for a lie that none of them even knew about. Something just feels like there's more to this, especially when she sees him for the first time and he is just like a polar express ice cold to his mother, which I get. Like he's had a narrative in his head for six years that this woman sent me to my death like this or this woman is like keeping everything. So I I get it in that sense. I I just want to know more about what that send off or what that like pre Brennan quote unquote death was like I just want to know so much more about that experience I need Brennan's princess tale I need it now I I I want to know more about it but for me it's pretty cut and dry with everything with Lilith like that to me makes total sense and it's all natural and I just have a lot of other questions regarding Brennan's you have many you went off for five minutes of all just nonstop questions I did and not a single one of them were about Lilith because to me it like this all just totally checks out for me Yeah. And I think also it's building on her development as well, where, you know, she loves and protects her children at all costs, in her opinion. (laughs) Um, And he does not view it that way whatsoever. And so I just find that that's a character development for her more than anything. Fair. When we're on this hilltop in Eurasia, we are meeting the other cadets from Resin who fought in the battle alongside Violet because there were three that she didn't know. We learn it's Kieran, which R.I.P. to my guy, Kieran. Like, I was convinced that Kieran was going to be like this, you know, like inside bad guy in Erasia, all this stuff. I even had GFDC, God fucking damn it, Kieran, ready to roll. And that did not happen. 
Kieran died very quickly and we didn't like I need to quote Lexi because I when I got to this part in the book I texted Lexi and was like oh my god Kieran died no and Lexi was like RIP Kieran we never got the chance to hate you GFDC is now saved though for god fucking damn it cat but we will get that in part two. Oh boy will we all get to that in part two we're gonna be having a lot of things to say about cat but when we're talking on this hillside we're meeting these three new characters we get to meet this guy Mason And I have mad hot respect for Mason. And let me tell you why. To be a writer, to fight in the Battle of Resin and have glasses. My guy has glasses that he's like pushing up on his face, which tells me that they're not fitted to his face perfectly. My husband, Brett, ran two half marathons with glasses, and I thought he was insane. To be a writer and have glasses is insanity to me. Also, how do flight goggles work? Are there like prescription flight goggles? And if you lose them, those fucking things are expensive. Like I... I have, oh, maybe it's in their couch, huh? (laughs) (laughs) I had some very nice prescription Ray-Ban glasses that, you know, my insurance covered most of, but I still very expensive. And I went swimming at Nicole's pool. And then later on, my glasses went missing. And I thought for sure that, you know, in the craziness of trying to get the children out of the pool and all that, that I left them there. And I could not find them at the pool. And I was heartbroken and I was going to try to get them replaced. And it was going to cost like $600. I I got a cheap pair from Target instead. What was it? Like five months later, Nicole's like just sends me a picture of my beautiful Ray-Bans. And it's like, hey, these were in our couch. And it's like, (gasps) I was so happy. And now I wear my glasses again and I can put the Target cheapies away. And so maybe... The spike goggles are in the couch. (laughs) Perfection. There's one other part I want to pull out of this dragon download. And that is when Violet is describing Andarna, she says, quote, I nod and study the coppery streaks in her eyes. Were those always there? Unquote. Now, the first part of this line, I wouldn't really have thought anything of it. I would just be like, oh, this is Andarna's new self. And we're just getting descriptions of this. But the second part, were those always there, really made me pause and be like, I need to do some research. So I looked up what copper means, for lack of a better term, and it's a symbol of wealth, protection, and prestige. Now, this could be something, probably not, but I just found it a very interesting note. Now, she could also be reflecting the landscape of Arisha in her eyes. Maybe, you know, it's July, so I'm not really sure if we're looking at, like, fall colors by any means, but I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. I don't have it in front of me right here but throughout the book there's also hints to violet's eye color changing as well so we will definitely keep an eye out for that because there's a lot of our listeners have pointed out that her and andarna's eyes and how they're changing really do mirror one another so we'll have to keep an eye out for that i love that that's delicious now as our crew is going to be returning to best Gaeth, i will say we covered this in detail during our audiobook sample reactions video but of course we need to highlight it here as well I think that their return to Best Guy, it's the perfect balance of feeling the weight and anxiety of this decision while also knowing it's the only right decision to protect the other marked ones and to keep the story moving along. You know, we have to keep things moving. We have to get them settled back at Best Guy for our story to continue. But there's a lot of disagreement about the decision among our characters here to go back to Best Guy. I love how our group here is echoing all of us readers when we're theorizing about the why of every possible option. Brennan, for instance, is convinced that their mom will let Violet be executed, but Violet knows better. And this difference of opinion makes sense for each of our characters. Brennan feels like his mom did sacrifice him for keeping the secret, so why wouldn't she do the same with Violet? While Violet, on the other hand, saw what losing Brennan did to their mom and knows she wouldn't have just let her co-workers execute her child. And then Kieran, my guy, comes to the rescue. Who would have thought that this fucker would come to Violet's defense and agree that General Sorengel wasn't there when orders against the marked ones and their parents were made. But now let's move on to one of my favorite lines in this entire book. (laughs) Fucking Dane. (laughs) And the fandom cheered. (laughs) I died. And I love how it just totally set up like all of our feelings about Dane. It's going to be quite the emotional journey here processing everything with Dane. Thank goodness we are still on the hate Dane train right now. But then Violet does say a few moments after she says fucking Dane that she's only 99% sure she can't trust him. Like, I know they were childhood best friends and that level of deep trust doesn't just go away. But after what he did, we're only 99% sure we can't trust him. 
after Liam, <laughs> this moment right here was when I was like, uh oh. His redemption arc might be coming sooner than we expected. This felt like Rebecca Yarrow <laughs> saying, hey, everyone, I know the fandom. I know you all hate this guy. But here's a reminder that we need to have 1% open for what's coming. But Violet says, quote, that 1% makes me question if Dane knows what was really waiting for us at Athbean. I'm sorry. I thought it was pretty fucking clear. When Zayden and Violet were at Athbean, it was right after they got the missive from Colonel Atos and Zayden was like, what did Dane say to you as we were leaving? And she said, he said, I'll miss you, Violet. And that was like this big revelation for us, for the fandom. And here it is just being like, oh, that's not actually what happened. And it's like, what? I have a lot of feelings about this. I do. (laughs) I have so many complicated feelings about Dane. It was so easy to just hate him. And now I don't know what to, but here I do. Here I get to hate him. We're not past chapter six, so we can still bask in our hatred. (laughs) During our bonus episode where we were talking about this audiobook excerpt, we speculated a lot about why Andarna being spotted while they're in flight heading back to Beskayeth and the Vale is so dangerous. And so the truth of the matter is, as a smaller black dragon flying with Terran, especially with the harness that everyone knows to be Andarna's and her assumed feather tail, they're immediately going to put two and two together. This dragon is no longer golden. It has to be the same one. And oh, that means that she must have been a hatchling before. So my best guess is because with dragons being very secretive, they want to keep everything that they do hold secret. Uh, keep it that way. Humans found a way to channel from the source. And maybe, you know, dragons are worried that they'll find a way to steal from dragons, just like they found a way to steal from the earth. Taryn's line says, quote, neither species has ever been entirely truthful, both using the other for their own reasons and nothing more. I get them not being trusting of humans and vice versa. Even Atos in Fourth Wing says, I'd like to run some tests on her, like basically says a line like that, especially now after the interrogation room scenes. I get it. I totally get them wanting to be super, super secretive. Who would stop them doing something like the interrogation scene, but with a dragon? Now, with dragons, they can speak mind to mind a lot further. So what would stop a bigger dragon like Taren or even Seagal coming in and just like tearing the interrogation place down? All in all, I think it's just truly the like Cold War almost style between dragons and humans. Like neither of us can trust each other. So we're going to hold all of our secrets as close to the chest as possible. Uh, The Cold War between them. That's a very good way of putting it. Thank you. I never studied that in school, so I appreciate it. (laughs) I was so excited about this dragon info dump when we read it in the audiobook preview. Like, as if you listen to that, you know how excited I was. We will definitely do a first six archive section at some point here. And this right here feels like a promise that the first six are going to play a very important role in this plot. It was the second time that they've been mentioned within these first three chapters, and they were barely mentioned at all in book one. So those are neon signs that show how important this world building context is for the story. It shows the first six are very, very important to the story as they absolutely will be. So Nicole, I want to hear your thoughts about how Violet feels towards Zayden right now because their relationship is definitely a little bit rocky. Violet has some not so nice things to think about him, but then she still is very attracted to him. He's got some cocky swagger. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this whole thing. Give me the mic. Give me a dissertation. I got this. Absolutely. (laughs) So first and foremost, I want to start with everything that she's feeling towards him is so hella valid, but I also understand her not just wanting to be an outright hostile bitch to him. I love that this even surprises Zayden. He says to her, like, I'm shocked you're not icing me out. And her response is so logical, which is just classic Violet. She says, quote, I'm angry with you for keeping information from me. Ignoring you doesn't solve that. But this is also the beauty of this morally gray character that we get from Zayden and thus this very gray area relationship that we get with Zayden and Violet. Also with him being so like, I'm going to get you back attitude, him kissing her palm when she like covers his mouth. He's like, yeah, like we've been a lot more intimate when you've been wrapped around and she like reaches up and covers her mouth. And I know he's just joking around with her. However, I do think that Zayden can be a little bit more... I'll rephrase it. He can ease his way back in a little bit more. 
it's not really Zayden to do that. But the fact that he's just like kissing her palm when she's like, don't say things. She like refuses to speak to him intimately, mind to mind. And he is just so cocky. Like homeboy is confident that he will be able to win her back. And on my first read, I'm not going to lie. I was a little frustrated, seems too heightened. I was a little taken aback. I was put off by his cockiness. Same. It wasn't from a place of like, oh, I'm cocky and I'm going to get you back in a like a I'm mutually understanding here. It almost felt like he was invalidating her anger towards him with how confident he was being. Yes. And on my reread, I felt that a little less throughout the book. This is the scene where it's most in the spotlight, where it is most like, I'm, you know, I'm going to be cocky and I'm going to get you back, rather than later on in the book where it's very passionate, like, I am fighting for you. I am fighting for us. There's a huge, huge difference there. I do love and slash hate the moment where she asks him about how long he's known about Brennan. And he tells her that just like straight up, he tells her I've known about him since his quote unquote death. And she's shocked. And my heart breaks for how shocked she is by the man she loves being actually honest with her. She even says, she's like, my jaw drops. And he asks her like, what? And she's like, you didn't evade the question. And the fact that that is so surprising to her is really heartbreaking. And it shows how much she desperately needs the truth right now. And the fact that Zayden is being all like, I'll only, I'll give you, I'll talk about this more in a second. But the fact that he's like, I'll only tell you the truth if you ask the right questions. She says it perfectly. She's like, you'll only give me the answers to the things that you want to give answers to, like not the whole candid truth. So I get her being really frustrated. It just all feels very human. I love it. I do as well. And similarly, I have a lot of feelings about Zayden and Violet's dynamic here in this book that we'll definitely parse through throughout our deep dive here. But I do want to just point out here, and this is something that Rebecca has said, and I love the analogy she uses. Zayden can't trust anyone, anyone with everything. Rebecca compares him to a CIA agent, and I love that. Violet needs to know everything. That's in her character. Her strength is knowledge. So that right there means that they're going to have conflict. He says that she fell for the leader of a revolution revolution. But in her defense, she didn't know it at the time. So now that she does know that she's in love with the leader of a revolution, they're going to have to kind of start over again with trust in a completely new way that conflicts with each of their needs. For him to have secrets to protect the people he loves and his mission, and for her to have all the knowledge in the world because knowledge equals power. And so they are going to have to come to some compromises together. And his compromise here is, well, I'll answer what you ask me. And from her perspective, perspective. She's like, no, 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 that's not how this works. So it's really interesting how it plays out. I know I got on a lot of people's nerves as they were reading it, but that's kind of the point is that it's realistic. It's not supposed to be enjoyable for us as readers because it's not enjoyable for our characters in the moment. If you're mad at Violet in this book, I don't blame you, but please remember what she's been through and how her world has completely turned upside down. I'm going to quote this and it really sums up everything that she's feeling in this book. Brennan's been lying to me for six years, letting me mourn his death when he's been well the fuck aware the whole time. My oldest friend stole my memories and possibly sent me to die. My mother built my entire life on a lie. I'm not even sure what parts of my education are real and which are fabricated. And he, Zayden, thinks I'm not going to demand total, complete honesty from him. And here's the thing. She expects full disclosure while he can't give it because so much is not his to disclose. And again, that brings us right back to that CIA analogy. And it's just so true. And it just, they have so much to figure out together because her points are valid, his points are valid, and they just need to communicate. And let's not forget that in Fourth Wing, whenever Violet was stressed or scared, she starts listing facts that she knows. And now she looks back on those facts and is questioning what's real, what's not. Her grounding. We get so many analogies to gravity in this book. Her gravity was knowledge. Her gravity was facts. And now that's not even part of what she knows to be true. I will say his, quote, some answers, especially after the last chapter of Fourth Wing, where he's like, I'm going to tell you everything, is a big Zayden L. You could have explained this better, dude. I'm going to call Zayden the fuck out. I get that Violet is absolutely in infuriated when Zayden says this for the first time. He is going back on his word and literally actually even 
flinches when she says to him, quote, as long as you meant what you said about telling me everything. It is not a great way to build trust back, my friend, by immediately starting off with like, oh yeah, that thing I promised you, I'm actually not going to do it. And Violet brings up a great point. I mentioned this earlier, but I want to mention it again. It's whatever truth he wants to share. It's truth on his terms, which she is like, I will not do that. My heart did break a little bit when, not a little bit, a lot of bit, when we get the quote, or I'll get busy unfalling for you. When she issues that ultimatum, he is actually genuinely surprised, which breaks my heart, but I'm also kind of like, Satan. Yeah, it's an ultimatum. Of course, it's a fucking ultimatum to exactly your point of what you just quoted, Lex. Like she needs to know this information. Now, I understand where he's coming from with the CIA agent and stuff and da, 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 da. But I think his subtext here is she cannot find out I'm an intrinsic. She cannot find out I'm an intrinsic. So he is, in my opinion, it is a little bit from a selfish standpoint of him not wanting to say he's going to tell her everything because if he did, he would have to tell her that he's an intrinsic. And he hasn't told anyone and I don't know if he was ever going to tell her I have a lot to say on that but we will cover that at a later time when he's saying you know like it has you have to ask the question I bet you he never thought that she would actually ask the question what's your second which is ridiculous and she even points that out because she's like (laughs) you told me that your grandfather bonded Segale like I was gonna figure it out and I think like to Violet's point later on in the book subconsciously he wanted her to figure it out he wanted her to know every single aspect of him but him here being like I'll only give you answers to the questions that you ask that is infuriating I do not blame her for being absolutely pissed at Zayden I wholeheartedly agree because the whole point here is that she doesn't know what questions exactly. to ask. Her whole world has been turned upside down. Can you give her some extra direction to know what even answers that she's supposed to be looking for? Yeah. Exactly. So Zayden definitely took some L's, uh, losses. L's mean losses. And we will keep track of that because we got to call our boy out. Everyone <laughs> we will keep track of. As you know, our crew here is returning to Pesgaeth. I have a quick question. What was everyone else's missions upon returning? Zayden doesn't do his friends the dishonor of asking if they accomplished their missions. And so I'm wondering, what were their missions upon returning? So it's kind of like Violet went to Liam's room to go get the letters. I'm wondering, did somebody else need to go to the forge for weapons or retrieving things from their rooms? I'm very curious about what the other missions were. That's a great point. It does really make me wonder. Quinn says, quote, war game sucked. You didn't miss much. Like everyone's just kind of strolling about. One of the classmates at Bezgaeth comes up to them and they're like, oh, fourth wing, you missed out. You like thought you were going to win war games. Meh. But to Quinn's quote for just from a second ago, war game sucked. You didn't miss much. Why does the graduating class lose 10% of their graduating class in war games if it kind of seems a little anticlimactic, boring? I think that it was entirely from this very specific character's perspectives that it might have been boring. Sure. Like instead of Zayden leading the charge as their wing leader and the whole group being all there together, and then it was Dane in charge. And it's like, of course, that's going to be a little bit more anticlimactic. That's a great point. <laughs> also, Violet does see like the turn it and how like there's x there's a lot of extra flames at first i was kind of like oh iron flame but no it's just like the burning of all of these people who did die so oh i didn't know malik commend their souls i did not think about that yes i don't really have anything worthwhile to talk about this but we have to minimum mention it going into liam's room and just seeing how it was almost like time had stood still in this room like his carvings were still on his desk and i was not expecting to cry so quickly in this book but here I was in chapter three weeping my eyes out because we went into Liam's room and I love that her mission was going to get the letter so that she could keep that promise to Liam regarding Sloan. And then you know my heart hurts for Violet when she's reunited with Rhee and then of course this is when Rhee and Riddick find out that Liam's dead. We don't often see their reactions to squad mates dying but it really is eye-opening to see them be human and hold that emotional capacity for one of their fallen squad mates. And Zayden rushing Violet away. I mean, he even is like, like warning Violet, like, don't tell Rhiannon, even just about the letters, like, don't even give the letters to her. That to me is just like, Zayden, accept the L. Here's your L. You're taking it. Like, he, yes, he has bigger things on his mind. So I do think it's understandable why he's like, I. we might die in any second. So I understand his anxiety here. But she, Violet, needed this moment with her squad mates. She absolutely needed it. Selective truce, staying away from her friends, closing herself from them to protect both them and this whole secret revolution 
it's a common theme in the first half of part one. And we see it blossoming here because, of course, it's hard for Violet to suddenly have the biggest secret in the world to keep from the people she cares most about, the people who are her chosen family. They're her squad mates. She can trust them with her life. But like Zayden says, she can't, at least right now, trust them with everyone else's lives too. And that's just really hard for her to parse through, understandably. So now as we talk about the whole War Games explanation and the lie and all of that, we did touch on it quite a bit during our reactions video, but I need to say it here again. Before this book came out, it felt like a really big deal how our crew was going to go back to Beskayeth and how it was this big unknown to us as readers. How like how are they going to explain this? And it ends up being kind of straightforward and pretty wrapped up in the course of a chapter or two, you know, minus the whole Atos now out to kill them all part, which I actually do love because while being accepted back at Biscayeth kind of just had to happen fairly quickly as well, there are real consequences. RIP to some of these Resin fighting cadets in the very near future. I love this description of how Zayden, it says, Zayden doesn't have to yell for his voice to be carried across the courtyard. Whereas Atos, the second he sees this crew roll up, he is immediately screaming. This is show, don't tell on full display here. We can feel Atos's I almost like compare. I'm almost comparing him to like Cornelius Fudge in Order of the Phoenix, where he is just unhinged the entire book and just like on constant, like on the edge of his seat. Whereas Zayden and you know to pull in the Harry Potter reference, Dumbledore in those situations, they're in full control, so they don't need to yell. Their emotions aren't like, oh my god, you. It's so calm. It's Zayden is just talking at his normal volume and yet everyone in the courtyard can hear him. Whereas Atos is full on freaking the fuck out, which by the way, again, I said this in battle brief. I'm going to say it here. Way to be conspicuous, my guy. Way to be like so obvious. It's so obvious that he was not expecting to see them, which immediately, if I was General Sorengale, and I think that this was her subtext, I would immediately be like, you know something I don't know, and you were behind this in a way that I don't like. Yeah, exactly. Oh, before we dive into Lilith and that whole exchange, which I just love so much, the best way I can describe their lies with war games and them kind of being accepted back here into Bezgaeth is I feel like we should have so much to say about it, but We don't. Besides the fact that it is gutting that they had to lie about Liam's death, even though it makes total sense in this context here, and immediately it's just not believable that Griffins could take down two dragons, especially Day. Off note here, I love that Zayden is speaking to the wings, not leadership, as he shares this story, because the dragons and their riders were part of the wings. Leadership doesn't give two shits about them, but their fellow cadets do. But back to, you know, we should have so much to say about this big, big question mark that as we were leaving from fourth wing. And I think that's kind of the point here from leadership, you know, even just like within the book, they needed to shut this down quickly and sweep it under the rug ish. We can't forget about those assassination attempts, but that's that. Like, that's that. Okay, great. We got to just wipe our hands here and keep moving forward with the story because that is what leadership needs to have happen. So I just thought that was really interesting, almost like that parallels between what we're trying to talk about here as we deep dive it and what's happening right there on the page. There is, however, so much reading between the lines with Lil Soren Gale when Violet and crew return not dead. And this is where I really felt the confirmation that she's got her own agenda. She's not a double agent or Brennan would have had very different feelings about her. She's not a big bad because she's relieved that Violet is alive and she's pissed about what happened, specifically pissed at Atos. So she and her daughter both know each other well enough to be able to read the other. Violet feels like she's, quote, just mom, which brings us to this amazing theory that Nicole has taken away. So there's this moment where Violet is giving her selective truths to Atos, to her mom, and she says, quote, before he, Liam's body, was even cold, I was stabbed with a poison-tipped blade. The passage continues, quote, mom's eyes flare and she jets her gaze away. Now, when I first read this, I was like, oh, concerned Mama Sorengale and that's it. But what if she recognized this in this moment that Violet was withholding information because Lilith is also familiar with a poisoned blade. When Lilith was pregnant with Violet, there in, you know, chapter one of Fourth Wing, we get that she had this sickness. But 
there's been a lot of speculation that she was in a fight with Venom and she got stabbed with a poison tipped blade. So what if she recognized that poison tipped blade and her eyes immediately flare because she knew that Violet was not telling the full truth. She knew it wasn't Griffin's. She knew it was Venom. And so she didn't send Colonel Atos away because he fucked up war games. What if she sent him away because she knew Violet knew the truth about the Venom, about the Wyvern, and Lilith knew Atos would do whatever he could to make it so that Violet didn't tell, aka assassins, which I'm assuming he's probably done before and it would be like a tell. Maybe it's a familiar move that Lilith is seen before, considering especially that he's her aide. This would also explain why she ended this meeting pretty fucking quick so that Violet would not be caught in her lie. I just love it. I was reading this on our outline and like my jaw dropped. I was like, I love it. I love that idea so much, especially just like her mom's mood kind of shifted when she mentioned the poison dagger. And I think that she absolutely recognized it for what it was. Now, I will have to go back through kind of her big reveal. And I believe it's chapter 36 after, you know, Violet's been tortured and all of that. And she has her big reveal. I'd like to read that part kind of with this in mind here to see if the if that aligns. But man, I love that idea. I love it so Amazing. much. Now, let's talk about God fucking damn it, Dane's dad. This guy sucks. Mama Sorengale comes in with facts. Quote, you emptied a strategically invaluable outpost beyond the wards for war games. And he says it was only for a few days. <laughs> this screams teenager who got in trouble with mom. I, like, Oh my God. You know, we had so many theories about why Athbane was actually deserted and the timing of all of it. Like I had a full blown timeline with everything and checkpoints and all these different factors that all brought the puzzle pieces together. But no, Dane's dad was indeed dumb <laughs> enough just to empty it out for war games. I specifically was like, no, he wouldn't do that. There's got to be this and this. Nope, that, that's what it was. As Lilith says for all of us, and clearly your discretion lacks common fucking sense. <laughs> Chef's kiss. So good. After Lilith like heads on out, she's like, you know, see you in my office in 30 minutes, Atos. There's this description when Colonel Atos is talking super quietly to Zayden and Violet. Spit flies from his mouth. Again, going back to my Cornelius Fudge moment, it is just shown that he is so out of control and so angry, whereas our two core characters are rooted and solid. We just learned so much about this guy from five words and one of those words being spit. Like, it's just beautiful. I love it. Stay tuned for today's bloopers. (laughs) How dare you at me like that? It's just so perfect. Atos can't come out and say that they're lying because what else could there be besides Griffins, right? It's so beautifully done. It's simple. It keeps the plot moving, but there's also newly built up tension to carry us forward in the story. I just, I really love how this whole thing was played out. Some people feel like it was a little bit too fast paced or underdeveloped. I strongly disagree. I think that it was exactly what it was to keep our story moving forward the way that it needs to. I agree completely. Speaking of moving our story the way it needed to. Let's talk about Dane and this reunion. It is so notable to me. And Lexi, I cannot believe I'm the one who caught this. I cannot believe. I can't either. (laughs) That you missed this. Absolutely flabbergasted. The fact that Nicole caught that Imogen is notably there during this reunion. Like she's just part of the crew. So I just kind of thought that she would be there. But like I didn't, I definitely miss this. You all remember that Imogen's signet is memory wiping, which I went on and on and on and on and on about in Fourth Wing. And then in this book, it's like nothing. (laughs) We get it twice. There's so many other instances that it would have been very, very applicable. And I have, I'm just going to pull myself out of the rabbit hole that I am trying to go down right now because I will just literally combust. (laughs) But anyway, back to Dane, which also kind of makes me want to combust. (laughs) Well, it's notable that she's there. She's the fallback. Like if Dane, you know, absolutely goes Colonel Atos route and goes absolutely unhinged, Imogen is there to like grab onto Violet and wipe her memory immediately. So I love that Imogen is just there with them, but it's also not conspicuous because she's part of their squad. It's brilliant. I love it. So it's moments like this 
that I can still hate Dane. Oh, and it makes my heart so happy. She, Violet has her moment of like, come near me and I'll cut off your fucking hands. Like absolutely just loses it. And I love it. And then he says, quote, you don't mean that, Vi. <sighs> I hate these things that it's <laughs> such a mansplainer thing to say. Like it just drives me fucking crazy. This is one of those things that people do when they're like, you don't mean that. And it's like, the fuck I do. Like you're not in my head. I do mean that. This is clearly one of my like number one pet peeves in life is when someone says this to me. I'm like, I know my own emotions. Don't tell me what I feel. But again, his I know you better than you know yourselfness. It pisses me off so much, but it's so Dane. It's it just it's so Dane. We all obviously have a lot to process about Dane. And I am not ready. I'm so not ready to bring up his redemption arc. And we're not bringing it into this part no. right here. So we are still firmly in the God fucking damn it Dane train right now. Ooh, that was hard to say. <laughs> the way he goes, Violet! And there's worry and relief etched in his face. Oh, God, I wanted to kill him so much in that moment. But no, Darren says you can't do that here. <laughs> which I just love too. <laughs> I love him so much, huh? By the way, if you're wondering what the heck God fucking damn it Dane means, hi, you must be new. Don't worry, you'll get it and you'll be yelling it right along with us very, very soon. Absolutely. So, so then of course we have Dane leaning heavily into playing on Dane's pride. I didn't fully understand how he was doing this until you explained it to me, Nicole, and I did a few rereads of it. So this idea for me is that, you know, Zayden makes this big like she chose me and not you declaration and it embarrasses him. It even says, quote, his Dane's face flushing so scarlet that I can see the color under the scruff of his light brown beard as everyone looks on. He's using embarrassment as the tactic to shut Dane the fuck up and to make it so that Dane will not go near Violet. And he also he Zayden also, however, embarrasses Violet in this moment. Which again, Zayden taking an L. Yeah, so Zayden, you know, he doesn't bother to lower his voice when he says it'll never be Dane and the whole quadrant knows it. And, you know, therefore he's essentially saying, Dane, you better keep your hands off of her because you do not have consent and everybody here knows it. So once I knew it kind of explained all of that and I reread it, it's like, oh, okay, I see how they're playing on his ego and his pride and embarrassment. And it made a lot more sense yeah, there. I do have a question, however. As they're doing this whole, like, she's mine, Dane, and like, remember this one word, Athbean, like, this is, you know, like a, maybe a five minute sequence between these three characters, or but four, including Imogen, between these four characters. What the hell's happening on the dais at this point? Like, are they just like silent and everyone in the quadrant is looking at them? Like, What's happening in the background? I would be very curious. I think that's the point is that it is all center stage right there. So and, awkward. you know, Zayden whispers Athbane to him. Yeah, like that's the whole point is that it is super awkward. And then, you know, Captain Fitzgibbons comes back and it's kind of like, okay, and back where we <laughs> left off. I, it's not exactly what he said, but, you know, something to that effect there. <laughs> oh, my God. That is so funny. Oh, poor Violet. I would just wish for a lightning bolt to the head at that point. I just feel like, kill me now, please. I'll just do it yeah. myself. I have the signet. Let's move on to actual graduation. <laughs> which is quite anticlimactic and short. This description absolutely guts me. After this whole like Dane spectacle, Violet goes back to her place in formation and Reese says, that was interesting, but it says, quote, her eyes puffy and red. Now, some people on the internet freaked the fuck out and were like, oh my God, Reese a venom. I think she was crying over Liam and learning that he died. I do not think Rhiannon is a venom. I'm going to be very firm in that. That is one that I can say with confidence. So, oh man, I did not mean to start this theory. <laughs> In our Patreon's monthly live Q&A, there was a question about, you know, who we might think is Venon. And so I had gone through uh, the ebook and did a search for any time that someone's eyes were referred to as red, because of course, that's a telltale sign that they're a Venon. And the very first one that came up was about Re and how her eyes were puffy and red. And I simply mentioned it just because, you know, I had to mention it. I found it in my research and uh, the comments blew up in that live <laughs> q &A. I swear to God. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't actually think that Re is a Venon. I'm simply pointing out my findings. I do actually think that, that maybe it was done on purpose because we do see a lot of other instances, both with Jack and with the attempted assassin, about their eyes being red. And so this might have been a way to try to throw us off with that first description about red eyes really and truly just being because of something else, because somebody had passed away and she was showing emotion in that way. You know, maybe Jack just has bad allergies or something like that. Welcome to the family, brother. Says otherwise. <laughs> if I was Rebecca, I would totally throw in lines like this just to 
fuck everyone over. I would totally do that just to stir the pot. Oh, of course. There's this line from one of the squad members in in second squad that says, quote, love triangles can get so fucking awkward, don't you think? Now, Rebecca Yaros has been on the record saying that she does not like love triangles. And this just feels like a little nod and very meta to us as readers who also do not like love triangles. I just thought that was so funny. Now, we get a lot of heads up, basically, of how uneventful graduation is. But I still cackled at how absolutely uneventful it is. You know, it honestly makes me wonder what infantry is like, where it's like this big celebration that the writers are for once jealous of. I'd love to, to join that party there. I find the anticlimacticness of it so reflective of this best guy than writer's quadrant culture. I talked a lot about it in our fourth wing episodes about the brutal culture that best guy really does foster. And Violet's new perspective on it after seeing battle is really going to be notable moving forward in our story. As she notes here, quote, maybe this place is exactly what the Griffin Flyer had called it, a death factory. So, you know, but this attitude of, oh, okay, cool. So do you want a reward for what you're supposed to do? It is so on point for the writer's quadrant and how this carries over with graduation. Survival is the reward of surviving these three years. Not a patch for being the most intact squad or other awards to pick up along the way. The ultimate goal is simply survival. And to then do what you are trained to do. Kind of like, you know, it's like, what, do you want to pat on the back for something that you're supposed to be doing already? Sounds like very low Sorengale, doesn't it? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. I do love Riddick's line about like a party so good you can't remember it. Such a good line. I love that. Yes. So as we move on into the next set of chapters, we have chapter five's opening or epigraph. And this epigraph is extremely telling. It says, quote, due to three consecutive deaths of prisoners during interrogations, Major Burton Varish should be reassigned from an active wing. The second I read this, I was like, and that's our new vice commandant. Absolutely. Like it was just so telling, you know, in our Iron Flame excerpt from the Today Show deep dive, we were speculating left and right about who this new vice commandant is going to be. And there were a lot of theories thinking that it was going to be Colonel Atos. And I'm really glad it wasn't. I'm so glad it was this new character, even though he was horrific. And I'm lucky, I feel very lucky to be able to say was, meaning he's dead. To to your point though, while a lot of us did wonder if it was going to be Colonel Atos and we're glad that it wasn't, I do love that it's a friend of Colonel Atos's. That he is the one who put this guy in this position. He's like the puppet master behind all of this. Oh man, he's going to be such a big bad. I can't Uh, wait to. I love a villain. I don't love Varish. He's horrific, but I love a well-written villain and he is so well-written. Now it is notable that this missive in this chapter five epigraph is from Samara Outpost, which is where Zayden is stationed. Even Taryn is like this outpost is known for being harsh and bad. So I just thought that was very telling. I, You know, I was wondering if there is a connection between Barish transferring from Samara and Zayden being assigned to there. You know, Zayden conveniently didn't get to choose his outpost. And to my understanding, just got the leftovers, a.k.a. Samara, which is the easternmost outpost of Southern Wing. Like you said, it's a pretty shitty place to be. <laughs> my best guess is based on how shitty of this place is and how much fighting they experience with the poor millions, prisoners plus interrogation equals Farish. So naturally, because there was a lot more fighting and there were a lot more prisoners to be captured, that's where he naturally was. That was just kind of like my wondering about that, but it is very interesting. I like that. How he was coming from Samara and that's where Zayden is now going. Oh, I like that a lot. Let's move on to this party. So good that you can't even remember it the next day. Look, I'm not a partier. <clears throat> any anymore but I want to party with the writers god damn that sounds so fun oh my gosh me too I want some of this lemonade I want to be dancing on tables like second wing like oh man so much fun I love that it's lavender lemonade it's like ooh, a cocktail like I wish my college had cocktails that good in this party scene we get to learn about a place called Shantara immediately I was like oh hello Hogsmeade it's nice to see And it was just such a fun, well-played Rebecca Yaros moment. I loved it. Now, I also want to highlight just how well-written this scene is. Not only does it explain to us readers what second year looks like and the perks that they get, Shantara, new classes, weekends off we get from Riddick, but we also get these moments of absolute survivor's guilt from Violet and how being secretive is 
absolutely tearing her up inside. And then Imogen coming up with this, like to Liam, getting that cheers and getting us, the audience, the opportunity to cheers him as well. When I got this, I was like, oh, he's like, we're never seeing him again. Absolutely. And then him showing up in the interrogation scenes later was so surprising. But I just, the scene was so brilliantly written from not only a character growth standpoint and being in Violet's head, but also from preparing us as readers on what to expect from a second year Basgaeth. I do have a question for you, Lex. Who do you think Quinn was close to who died at Threshing? Because Quinn makes this declaration of don't get close to any first years until after Threshing. But then it says, quote, she grimaces. Just trust me. Who from her squad was she close to? I'd have to reread like the first half of Fourth Wing to answer that. But man, it's it really reminds me again of what Mira had said to to Violet too, where it's like, don't make friends. Like all of anybody who has survived to their second year has seen some shit, has experienced some real heartbreak. And that's part of the point is that they get toughened up so that they do have these pieces of advice where it's like, no, don't get close. Here's one thing I will point out because I don't have this confirmed. So please keep this in mind with a grain of salt. But in Fourth Wing, I think it's the morning after threshing that Quinn and Imogen come to sit with the first years and, you know, they have their like, you weren't worth getting to know beforehand to that. But Violet thinks to herself, Quinn normally sits with her girlfriend. Do you think that Quinn's girlfriend was a first year and got killed? She wasn't because she was actually older and she's now graduated because we got confirmation on that just a little okay. while ago. In Here the I scene. was thinking I cracked the code. Yeah. God damn it. Now, I want to pour one out for our guy Garrick for a second because multiple times in this series, Garrick and Zayden are chatting and Zayden is not looking at Garrick, the guy he is in an active conversation with. He is looking at Violet and he's having a mind to mind conversation with Violet. Now, knowing what kind of banter we get from Garrick from the Fourth Wing Special Edition bonus Zayden POV chapters. What I would give to hear the ways that Garrick calls Zayden out for not paying attention to him, I would give anything for those. Oh my gosh, me too. It's like when like you're having like a conversation with someone and like they're just texting somebody else and it's like, hello, like I'm right here Drives too. Me and except like it's mind to mind too. Oh my gosh, so funny. <laughs> and it, it happens with Violet. Like Violet comes up to them and that like she's like, like studying Zayden and being like, you look really good in officer flight letters. And, and Garrick is even like, hey, Soren Gale, good job today. She does not look at him and she says, thanks. And finally he comes back with the perfect line and he's like, God, you two figure your shit out. <laughs> Pour one out for Garrick. I love this line and it is so relatable to anyone who's ever been drunk. Not me though. I've never been drunk in my entire life. Absolutely not. <laughs> never with Lexi. Absolutely not. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, mixing alcohol in Zayden is definitely not a good idea. Or is it the best idea? <laughs> I love this because anyone who's been at a party and seen that one person that like you should not leave said party with, they know that exact tennis match happening in your head. I have absolutely no idea what you are oh, talking bullshit. about. Oh, bullshit. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> there is no way. Uh, I might know better than anybody on this one. <laughs> I was going to say, moving on. I know. You are so hot. And especially in college, you could get any guy you wanted. But I know you know this feeling. <laughs> we'll die on that hill. What am I supposed to say to that? <laughs> Your silence says everything. Also, later on in the courtyard, it's described as, quote, a ballroom two hours after everyone reasonable has left the party full of drunkards and bad decisions. This is college, a frat party in a nutshell. We all know the frat party or just the college party you stayed a little too long at. This is perfect. I Shut up. You do know this feeling. I'm not the only one here. <laughs> I'm just I, like, no, I'm innocent. What oh, are you talking please. <laughs> Now, last little part of this uh, that is just so relatable, and this one's to my fellow theater kids out there. When they're walking past the board that's about to have the officer's announcements on it, every single theater kid who's been waiting for a cast list to be posted knows this feeling. It's described as the, quote, list is going to appear at any second, and they might be erased from it if someone discovers they're not watching. This is like every single time a cast list was going to be announced in college and in high school, it's like you would 
do whatever it takes to be one of the first people to see said list. And of course, our guy Dane is at the center of it. Of course. (laughs) Shouts to my fellow theater kids. I love you. We get to meet Varish in a a perfectly way. It says, quote, perfectly pressed uniform. His hair is perfectly combed. His boots perfectly shined. His smile perfectly cruel. Umbridge fucking vibes. Also, I want to shout out to the audiobook narrator because she does such a slimy voice for him and it's perfect. Oh man, I will say one of the few voices that she nails, I have some feelings about her cat voice, but you mean for a different the time. British accent that comes in halfway through Kat's character? I don't understand. It's like Peter Baelish from uh, Game of Thrones. It's like, <laughs> what accent are we going with here this chapter? <laughs> dead i love these descriptions of zayden taking the missives it says quote careful not to touch varish's hands it makes me think about how many other signets there are with touch being involved again we still don't know colonel atos's signet and it's stressing me out so as i'm doing my reread i am noticing that zayden is particularly careful not to touch any of the mind wielders hands i don't know if that's the exact term that they use in the book mind wielders that's what i'm calling them here because he knows what their signets are even if they're classified because hello he's an intensic he can know that and so he is very careful for anybody who has those mind wielding abilities to not touch them because they might be like Dane where touching them gives them that extra power probably touching Varish that might be breaking through his shields or something you know you know it gives them that extra connection to then take their signet power to the next level to really fuck with them right you know we knew atos was a wolf in sheep's clothing by the end of fourth wing but the fact that he is so friendly with varish that he is putting him in charge knowing what he does about varish make no mistake varish is here to tighten the ship that are the marked ones and now violet however i do want to point out that atos and co thought zade and violet and all of them were dead when varish was initially assigned so i think he was here to originally keep the marked ones in line but then the moment violet and all of them came back he had a much bigger purpose that was quite convenient right and then other the line the transformation from bad guy back to this uncle like figure is so eerie for violet yeah no shit it's just his whole character right there on the page for us and then he threatens to kill mira too like that was actually kind of shocking to me it's like whoa, you are really bad. It was shocking and yet not so shocking in the same way. Like Exactly, exactly. We are just getting the tip of the iceberg of Atos. And I feel like he is going to be our big, big, like I was thinking it was going to be Melgren be the big, big bad. And obviously we have the Venon. They are the biggest and the baddest. But I think Atos is, we are not done hating Atos by a long shot. But moving away from characters we hate into characters that make us swoon. So the Zayden goodbye scene. I know that, you know, it's only seven days that they're not going to see each other for at, at any given moment or eight days, I guess, in this in this stretch. But the fact that anyone who's been in a long distance relationship knows, like when you're, you know, you're going to talk to them every day, you know, you're going to FaceTime, you're going to do whatever. But that initial goodbye at the airport I always would cry like every single time, even though I knew it was like you were just going to see them soon. It's just like this heavy emotional moment. Now, however, I know that Violet wants to help the Marked Ones and the revolution, but I got to give Zayden credit where credit is due. He's making points here because every eye is going to be on her. And she does not have a rebellion relic to hide her actions. That is huge. Huge here. I do agree with you that he is making some very valid points. I am still going to stick to my earlier statement that he is taking some L's in the stretch, which I know that you agree with. I love Zayden. I really do. Yet Violet's frustration with him in this whole stretch of chapters is so valid. Quote, I bristle at the implication that I'm the problem here. I bristled at the fact that he was saying this too. They've both got good points and they've both got their sore spots here as well. So again, that just brings me back to what I was saying earlier. It's like, oh, like they have a lot of communication, not only just communication, but individual feelings that they have to work through to be able to come together, which they sort of do in a way in this book. Until the end. And then it's like, wait, what? (laughs) We'll get there eventually. Here's what I will say in regards to this moment. We're still in the cocky Zayden, and I'm still going to 
plant my feet firmly in the cocky Zayden who's not respecting the fact that she is as angry as he is as she is he's leaning more into that I'm passionately going to get you back Zayden which we're going to see in full swing for the rest of part one but it's kind of that like tiptoeing the 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 line of I'm being cocky and I know I'm going to get you back and again not really validating the fact that she is still really pissed off at him and hurt I keep on saying pissed off but underneath that it is sheer hurt and betrayal so and he's not really honoring that as much in these two scenes but he says quote guess alcohol doesn't dampen your signet this makes me wonder what signets do get dampened by alcohol I'm guessing the mind related signets but I don't know what do you think maybe and I wonder if that's the case then he might know from personal experience because he's an oh mm-hmm. I didn't think about that's that my guess. that'd be interesting let's get Dane drunk <laughs> Get Dane drunk. I would do anything to see drunk Dane on the page, but only if it's narrated by Zayden. That's my one request. Yes. Yes. Ah. I bet he'd be a really boring drunk, actually. Yeah, probably. Actually, he'd be one of those like, uh, da 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 She's like, go shut up and stand in a corner. <laughs> we still hate Dane. <laughs> We're not at chapter 36 yet. Hooray. <laughs> I need some clarification here. Why is Zayden disappointed both times that she says, I trust you with my life? Mm, My life is pretty damn good, in my opinion. And the fact that he's like, it even describes like hurt or disappointment flashes across his face. Why? He wasn't fully truthful with her. Like, I think this is pretty good. So, so funny, because I actually read it very differently. At this guy, they are all trained to trust each other with their lives. Like, that's one of the big takeaways. And so, of course, they're going to trust each other with their lives. Like, they're both trained to do that. They have this history together. Of course, a romantic history, but more than anything, a having each other's backs history, both in training and in actual battle. So, of course, she trusts him with her life. But he needs more than that. It's not just her life. They both have made it very clear that their lives are not the most important thing to them because they've got they went out on a suicide mission expecting to die. So he needs more than just her life. He needs her, her soul, her emotions, her wanting to trust him and all of its entirety, not just with her actual life. So that's the way that I read it. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. I appreciate that. Last thing before we move on to our foreshadowing section, we made it eventually six chapters. Jesus. Zayden says, quote, try not to burn the place down while I'm gone. When I read this for the first time, I freaked the fuck out at this line. Literally the tagline is, I knew you would. I thought of you when I first read this line. I was like, oh, there's Nicole with her burn it down. (laughs) Now here's the deal. There are so many relations and moments with fire and burning in this book. And I will be calling out every single one of them. You betcha. But this is one of the big first ones. When I read this, I was like, oh my God, burn it down. This is it. This is the foreshadowing. It's going to be Bez Gaeth. Now it was not quite accurate here. The burn it down or the burning that is really, you know, related to Iron Flame does happen at Bezgaeth, but not in this way. So that was just a fun little egg on my face, <laughs> how much I freaked out at that line. So while we definitely touched on quite a bit of foreshadowing in this stretch of uh, tapping into our signet powers, there is always a few other lines that we just have to pull out as they relate to other parts, both in this book and what we perceive to be the series, and other lines that just really catch our attention that we're going to keep an eye out for things moving forward. So to kick us off here, other dragons in Arisha hit the battle survivors in a net- network of caves within the valley we are going to see these caves i love that we're going to get to go there later on i will hope that we learn some other stories from some of these battle survivors somebody from the assembly maybe the cave chapters and like just that stretch of chapters between that and intrinsic my favorite stretch of the book i cannot wait to talk about it during the assembly meeting when talking about viscount Takaris, the assembly members are accusing zayden of insulting him last summer and he has a new offer that zayden won't consider well, we learned that this old offer was his betrothal to Kat, and he broke it off last summer, right before he met Violet Sorengale, before she walked on the parapet. And we learned that Viscount Takaris is Kat's uncle. Another part day in the assembly meeting, Surrey asks Felix if he proposes, quote, running in our own war college with all our spare time. Yeah, that's exactly what you all are going to do. Yep. And do it. <laughs> 
do it fairly well. I think they do it fairly well. Especially for completely imprompt with them just being dropped on their doorstep. <laughs> Poor guys. We learn that Zayden has taken responsibility for Violet, quote, as brutal of a custom as it may be. But we don't understand what exactly this means until later. Zayden's new scar was purposefully made just like the other scars on his back to represent his responsibility for Violet. We also learn from Lilith in the interrogation scene that this is a tearish custom but then she is cut off by Violet. The signs of the venom closing in on Zulia. So Brennan asks for an update on Zulia in the morning at the assembly meeting. This is towards the end. There are orange flags, which means the activity in the last few months, very close to it on their big old map. But within the next few months, it is going to fall to the venom. Zulia is also where the Griffin Flyers College is. And wait, what? Arisha has a wardstone, but no one knows how to create wardstones? <gasps> Yes, essential knowledge to chase after. I love it. I love it. I love it. When I first read this, I was like, yep, this is going to be the key to saving everyone. And then, of course, it's part of the path towards that, but it's not the ultimate reveal, which that would just be too predictable. I love, love how these things happen where it's like, oh, that, and we kind of grab onto it and we get so excited. And of course, it's part of the bigger picture, but it's not, we can't even comprehend what the real big picture is. Okay, so this next line, it's treated like a throwaway line, but I am convinced it is going to come back in later books. Brennan says, something killed off the venom 600 years ago during the Great War, and we're actively searching for that weapon. What? There's a weapon that we're searching for? How much do we want to bet that Violet and maybe Andarna are critical to this? What if they are maybe part of the weapon? Either like Violet is the weapon herself or she activates it. I don't know, but there are keys to some of something with this weapon. Violet knows that the venom poison didn't permanently take her power and bond away. And I have to say, this description of the venom poison is awfully similar to the serum that our second years are forced to drink. Could they be the same substance. Was Navarre inspired by this poison and they replicated it for their own purposes? Nicole's nodding uh -huh. her head. <laughs> That's exactly what I think it is. Because uh -huh. in, in Fourth Wing, there's a line about this is after Violet's been stabbed. I think this is chapter 38. She says something along the lines of what poison would not only something or other, but cut me off magically. And that immediately stands out on a reread. According to Coda, two more black dragons have hatched in the past year. What? This cannot be a throwaway line, I am convinced. I doubt we'll see these two soon-to-be black dragons grow from the golden hatchlings to big badass flying battle dragons, but there is something to these extremely rare black dragons where Taren, the youngest black dragon, I, I think he's at least the youngest, he's over 100 years old. And now there's two new black dragons? I don't know what the foreshadowing is here, but I'm calling it there is something. I don't know if it's some kind of special magic in the air where black dragons are now coming back. I don't know, but there is something to this. Next, Brennan says about their mom, quote, you don't think she'll kill you? She threw you in the writer's quadrant. But Violet knows their mom better. Yes, she did throw her in the writer's quadrant, but she became a writer. And we later learned that, yes, her mom did want to protect her from sure death that she was inevitably going to have learning the truth as a high-ranking scribe. So she did send her to the writer's quadrant knowing that she would have a chance. And then Andarna tries to flare her wings out, quote, but only one fully extends and she stumbles under the uneven weight, careening forward. While we don't think much of it now because she's described as a newborn horse here, we learn later that this is the moment that Taryn became worried her wings aren't going to fully grow properly because of her interrupted sleep. And that just makes me really sad that it seems so casual right here and it's actually going to play a very big role moving forward. Violet reflects that Taryn didn't tell her about this big secret about the venom and Zayden and the revolution and everything because he was bound by his mating bond to Segale. This sets up how big of a deal it is that Segale keeps Zayden's biggest secret from Taryn. And I think that when Violet learns that even Taryn didn't know, she begins to soften and understand why Zayden didn't tell her his biggest, darkest secret. Even Segale broke that sacred bond with her mate by not telling him. I think that's really notable here that it's reflected that Taryn, of course, wouldn't not tell Sigale something, which sets up later that Sigale doesn't tell him everything. Zayden tells Violet to tell selective truths, and she begins learning how to navigate not telling an outright lie, but also not the full truth. This is absolutely going to come in handy when she gets interrogated and Nora, fucking Nora, is there to know when she tells lies. GFDN, god fucking damn it, Nora. When they're walking to graduation, they pass by a bust of the first six. There are so many first six mentions in this set of chapters 
chapters. This is just one of them, but it is setting it up for how big of a role the first six play in this book. Also, when Zayden is telling Violet to keep her shields up and she says she can't even keep him out, he says, quote, I'm harder to block than most. Correct, sir. Yes, you are, because your mind powers are very different than others. Hello, Intensic. Also, Lilith, when they come in for graduation, Violet has a moment when she's describing her mother that she's almost scared to call pride. And later when Zayden says we almost lost Sorengale, meaning Violet, she looks at Violet with worry and horror in her eyes. She looks at me like she's just mom. It's lines like this that prime us for the big reveal for Lilith at the end of part one, and of course, to be emotionally connected to her when she does end up dying at the end of the book. I don't know how emotionally connected <laughs> I feel to her. Actually, say this just real quick here. I'm also a mother who, of course, protects her children at all costs. And it's like, I I, I can relate to Lilith in that way. However, she is just her character is not an emotional character, even in little tiny moments like this. So a lot of people are upset about how her death wasn't like this big I'll call it Liam impact. And it's kind of like, well, of course it wasn't. We loved Liam. Everybody loved Liam. We got to know him on a level that it's literally impossible to do with Lilith's character because if we got to know Lilith on such an emotional level, at least more than we already did, it would have been even more out of character for her. So just wanted to share that. And we'll talk so much more about Lilith in coming chapters here. Speaking of Lilith, Zayden alludes to his and her deal when he hands crumpled orders to her. I chose to save your daughter. That's their agreement. And that's kind of like when it like checked off for her where it's like, okay, Zayden, you're off the hook because he literally called to her in front of everybody their agreement, but nobody else picked up on it. I loved that. There's this moment where Violet realizes the brutality of this school and it's really starting to sink into her. Quote, the final test of war games is always deadly, ensuring only the strongest riders move on to graduation. But Liam was the strongest of our year and even that didn't save him. One of the big reasons for bringing the Griffins and telling us about their threshing and all of their culture is so that we are primed to start questioning the brutality of Bezgaeth. And Violet even starts to ask this outright, quote, does it need to be this brutal? Do these methods actually work? Later in this chapter, she says, quote, maybe this place is exactly what the Griffin Flyer called it, a death factory. Also shouts to our girl Serena because she's the one who called it the death factory. I love Serena. I cannot wait to start talking about her. Also, when we're at the party, Ree says that she's excited to finally talk to her family and get the second year writing privileges. Quote, we share a small smile, neither of us mentioning how we snuck out of Montserrat to see her family family a few months ago. This is reminding us readers that it's not common knowledge and priming us for when it's used later on when they need to share a secret during RSC interrogation. And then there's this line, secrets make for poor leverage. They die with the people who keep them. So obviously Colonel Atos says this to Violet and Zayden, and then we also get this exact same line from the infantry cadets slash assassins that they use right before they try to kill Violet. Okay, so what did Colonel Atos look to them? Okay, (laughs) But right before you kill them, you have to say this line so that they know it was me. Like he's like that big bad villain where as soon as they have like the hero trapped and then they give like their full monologue because they have to know it was them. You know, they have to finally share. This is totally like this just plain telephone a little bit. I just thought this was like, wow. I think Atos is also just a bad assassin boss. Like He's just not very yes. conspicuous. Like, Last but not least, Ree's first declaration as squad leader is live. She says this to all of the second years of second squad, but sadly, it looks like Nadine did not get that message. What a way to die. Uh, that was horrific. We'll get to that next episode. All right, friends, we are now at the part of each episode where we are going to dive into the archives. This is where we choose a topic that was prominent throughout the stretch of chapters, and we're really going to dive into it. We're going to pull source material from both Fourth Wing and Iron Flame, anything else that we have available at our discretion here. And today's topic is the Ryerson House and Arisha. Also, shouts to our Dragon Riders on our Patreon who voted for this being our archives topic. Thank you so much. We love each and every one of you. I love you all so much. A shout out again to some of our Discord members who I was really nervous about this archive section. I really tried to pull everything. It was at about 80%. I shared it with them and several of our Discord members started pulling in extra source material. So this really was a group effort here on today's archive sections. So let's dive in. The Ryerson House. It is described as half palace, half home, and 100% fortress. 
But hey, this fortress has culture with good food too. We cannot forget that. Let's talk about this fortress. It is five stories with thick stone walls. Keyword, stone. It survived the burning of Arisha because it's built so much with stone, which obviously doesn't burn. There are three, I think three, wings in this massive house that I'm just personally going to call a castle. It's a castle. It has 100 barracks rooms between three top floors connected by a sweeping double staircase. How lovely. This does not account, however, for the family quarters that are on the second floor, like Zayden's room, for instance, which is described to have big, beautiful windows, thick velvet drapes, wall-to-wall book shelves and, hey, a massive bed. Not all of these 100 barracks rooms are serviceable, though. Not everything in this house has been repaired and rebuilt yet. We've got steel-enforced double doors in the entryway, a cavernous foyer connected to a great hall, courtyards with marble floors. There's art on the walls and poor Amelia's tapestry hanging. There's intricate carpets. This place is absolutely lovely, folks. And they surprisingly rebuilt a theater in the Northwest Wing. Now, there is enough seating here for more than 100 cadets, which we will see Battle Brief take place here in part two of our story. This theater also has a map that is the height and width of the stage, and this map shows the aisles and the truth of what's really going on. And then, of course, we've got to talk about the assembly room. There is a table that could seat 30 in this two-story room. There's another gigantic map that rivals the one of Asgaiath. But hey, it also actually shows the information we all need. And then there is this massive chair, Nicole is getting excited, built for someone of Zayden's height. Dare I call it a throne? <gasps> this throne has a high, intricately constructed back and the figure of a sleeping dragon perched on its pointed tip. I love that. The chair does look to be half burned, which would make sense given what happened at Arisha. Now, Ryerson House is a defensible position carved into the mountainside. This fortress is literally carved into the mountain. It has never been breached by any army, even though it has been through countless sieges and three full-on assaults. The fortress looks down on the valley below with a line of charred trees marking where everything was burnt. Now, Ryerson House's greatest asset is the valley actually above it, not below it. Below it is where the town is. Above it is heated by natural thermal energy. We will talk about that in a moment when we get to details about Arisha. Now, as far as the aristocracy of Ryerson House, I'm actually going to do a full archives of the aristocracy on the continent, but we're going to keep it high level here right now. As a result of the Treaty of Arisha, the providence of Tyrandor was transferred from the Ryersons to the Llewellyns, which is a family that stayed loyal to Navarre. However, Arisha itself notably wasn't taken over by one of these loyal families. Nobles weren't exactly eager to throw their money at a scorched city or be taxed on unusable land, <laughs> or so they thought. So Arisha is still under Ryerson, which means that Zayden is the head of Arisha. All right, now let's talk about Arisha. It used to be a city. It was the capital of Tirandor. Now, since it was burned six years ago, it's been reduced to a town and it's rebuilding these past six years after, of course, the dragon fire burned it all down. The structures all have identical green roofs and it has two very notable landmarks. One is the Temple of Amari and two is the Arisha Library. I feel like the Arisha Library should have come into play in Probably. our story here. But anyway, General Melgren and Navarian leadership are not aware of Arisha being rebuilt. The Marked One's relics mask them from Melgren's signet when they're obviously in groups of three or more. He can't see the outcome of any battle they're present for, so he's not able to quote unquote see them organizing a revolution here. I'll admit I have some questions about the specifics of this, but we'll address that in a later episode. Arisha and its occupants aren't technically hidden, they're just not advertising their existence. Arisha is an 18-hour flight from Beskaith. Woof! Talk about a road trip. It is not, however, protected by Navarre's wards. They don't extend far enough to reach the mountainous borders of Navarre, including Arisha. This has never been a problem before because the only known threat was griffins, and the griffins cannot handle the altitude in these mountains. They can't fly high enough to clear the cliffs. We learn all about this in part two. Now, it is interesting, however, that Arisha has crossbows for defense. We learned that in part two, too. What are the crossbows for? Are they for other dragons? Are they for griffins? I don't know. Just something interesting to note here. Now, Arisha also has a dormant wardstone. <gasps> what? <laughs> Which, of course, Violet partially sort of activates, but not really. It would be really great if they can activate this wardstone at full strength and extend the wards into poor meal, helping keep even more people safe from the venom. That's obviously a big thing that they're trying to do here. They don't succeed. 
moving forward. How do you access this Orisha Wardstone chamber, you ask? Well, 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 out the back door in Ryerson House is a trail and a man-made canyon in the mountainside, and the Wardstone is about 100 feet below within the chamber. Now, this canyon opens up to the sky for access for the dragons, and at the end of this trail, we have a set of guards. I'm going to save the details about the Wardstone and the chamber for its own archives, but what's important here is that there is an inactive Wardstone here in Orisha, and if activated, they can raise the wards and protect themselves from Venice. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> in Orisha, there is a wide valley to the east, which has a network of caves in them. This is the valley that is Ryerson House's greatest asset, which is above the house, not the one below where the town is. And it's a steep, rocky trail that connects Ryerson House to the valley. This is where the original hatching grounds of the Dumadine line descend. That's the black dragon line, aka the two greatest dragons of this time, Coda and Terran. We can gather some of these caves are only accessible from direct flight in to protect hatchlings and the adolescent. You can only be a dragon to get into these caves. Now this valley, it has natural thermal heat, which we mentioned earlier. For instance, there's snow in the town, but not in the valley below. Now the reason that there is more heat in this valley is because there's dragons there. The more dragons that come in, like in part two, the hotter this valley is going to be. I love that part there. So there you have it, folks. That is the basics there of Ryerson House and Arisha. So we can learn all that foundational world building as we carry forward in our story. I love how you call it foundational and basics. That was delicious, Lex. I loved that. Thank you so much. And thank you to our Discord members who assisted. That was awesome. So now let's close out this episode by taking flight with our favorite moments from these stretch chapters. So Violet observes how Bodhi and Imogen are comfortable here in Arisha, once again showing just how often they've traveled to Arisha. I still have questions about how they've been able to sneak off to Arisha, which is 18 hours away, one way. I have so many questions about that. But we also know that Bodhi has spent a lot of time here when he and Zayden were growing up because his mom was Ben's sister. But what about Imogen? Did she become comfortable in Arisha before the rebellion or only after threshing? I'm assuming she also grew up in Arisha, maybe. I don't know. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. But Liam also knew, but he he didn't grow that's up in true. Arisha, so I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I love this. I know I've harked on Brennan so much more than he probably deserves in this episode. <laughs> but one of my favorite moments is him just not knowing jack shit about the wyvern and the venom. It was so unexpected, but it was also hilarious. And I just, I loved it. The theme of hope is consistent throughout these books. And I want to pull this beautiful line. Because love at its root is hope. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for what could be. Hope that the someone you've entrusted your everything to will cradle and protect it. And hope, that shit is harder to kill than a dragon. So this particular description of hope when it comes to love most definitely will come back into play following the end of this book. But there are so many other representations of hope in this book. Like even right now, Brennan is holding on to the hope that they'll win. He just has to for the same reasons that she shares here. Like it's the root. And even though Violet's like, are you kidding me? Like, why do you have hope in this? It's like, well, he just, he has to. They all have to have hope in order to keep moving forward, to even try. So I just, I love that. And we might not get very much Sagale in this book, but at least we get this line. Violet says that Sagale only tolerates her, but Vi is growing on her, to which Sagale replies, like a tumor. I love her so much. I also loved seeing someone learn about the Zayden and Violet mental connection. And Brennan saying, that's really fucking weird. Like, I love people because I don't know how many people know about their mind to mind connection. It's not really stated. I love getting to see that through Brennan's gaze. I also love that the teenage dragons are just known for being so sassy. Taryn says, quote, they don't have much patience for humans or elders or logic. I love getting more descriptions about Zayden and Violet its bonds. Last book, we got a teaser from Zayden about being able to tell proximity. And I guess that's starting to work for Violet now. Quote, the shadowy bond wrapped around my mind strengthens. That's when Zayden's coming closer to her on the hill in Arisha. And we've already pulled this, but man, Violet saying, fucking Dane really hit home the amount of messages we got from you all being like I read this in your voice or oh my god, she's been listening to fantasy fangirls really made us so happy. So if anything, that just is just delightful for Lexi and I to see. And then when Andarna wakes up, Zayden whips his shadows out to keep Andarna from face planting as if we needed reasons to love Zayden more. 
Ah, and the good old Taryn back with his sass. I've killed lesser writers for that kind of insult. I just love him so much. Speaking of Taryn sass and Andarna sass, Violet, thinking that this is going to be a long year with Taryn and Andarna arguing, she says, quote, all right, kids, let's not argue. Also, Violet saying, love you too to Taryn, just like warms my heart. I didn't know how much I needed to hear Violet say I love you to Taryn, but I apparently needed it pretty, pretty badly. <laughs> I did too. I loved that part as well. And then Zayden admitting he's considered scraping the plan and just throwing Dane off the parapet. And and he's being serious about it, too. (laughs) I'm (laughs) laughing. Way to speak for a fandom, my guy. So good. Garrick says, it would be unfortunate to make it all three years and then die on graduation day. I just, I love Garrick. Zayden knowing just how to make an entrance. Him walking in saying, well, this is awkward, is a 10 out of 10 Zayden moment. To which Fitzgibbons replies, you're not dead. (laughs) So good. Lil is saying that Violet is more like her than she gave her credit for since she was thrown into battle and survived a knife wound as a first year. During the battle at the end of Fourth Wing, Violet was realizing and she even embraced that she is more like her mom. And I just love that parallel from the end of Fourth Wing in Violet's perspective to what we see here from Lilith. Zayden calling Colonel Atos out. Surely, if you think there's another threat out there, you'd want to share that information with the rest of the quadrant so we could adequately train to face it. Way to lay down some logic, dude. I love it. Meeting up with Dane, quote, a swift kick to the balls wouldn't be uncalled for, would it? And yeah, you're right. But unfortunately, we did not get that on the page. (laughs) And then when Violet starts denying wanting to be with Lieutenant Ryerson, her squad just cuts her off with a resounding boo. I love that. It was just so like fun with your friends. Speaking of that moment, when Violet says, I'll be back and she goes to meet up with Satan, Riddick says, quote, I certainly hope not, or you'll destroy all my fantasies when it comes to that one. I missed Riddick. Oh my God. Violet wondering if teenage dragons doing the dreamless sleep is also so that the elders can avoid the majority of teenage years of moody dragons. I love that. And last but not least, quote, I'd much rather have you under me on the mat than spare time. Ugh, yes, Satan. Thank you. Spicy. Oh my goodness. Well, that's it, folks. Whew, what a doozy here. Thank you so much for joining us as we start this Iron Flame deep dive journey. We are so excited. Next episode, we will be covering chapters 7 through 12. And we'd love to thank our producer, Hayden. He is our sanity manager. He helps us keep things running. So thank you so much to our Hayden slash (laughs) Zayden. In Discord, he's called Hayden, but he has in parentheses right after the H and X. So it's like Hayden, but Zayden. I fucking love it. He's amazing. We love you, Hayden. And speaking of Discord, if you are wondering how the heck do I access Fantasy Fangirls Discord, well, you can join the Patreon party. Like we said at the top of this episode, we have two tiers, cadets and dragon writers. This is the best way to support Nicole and I as we do this Fantasy Fangirls journey. And really and truly, your support as a Patreon member means everything to us. So please check that out if you'd like to join that party. Speaking of parties, if you are not following us on TikTok or Instagram, what are you doing? Go on, give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod on TikTok. It's where the main party is. But hey, most of the behind the scenes and the real fun stuff is on Instagram stories. Also, if you have not already, please take a moment to rate and review the show. When you rate and review on both Apple and Spotify, as well as like and subscribe on YouTube, You help us so much with getting this podcast out to new people and also help us get higher on the charts. Lexi, do you know where we are on the Spotify charts today? 61, baby. I'm so excited. Out of all podcasts on Spotify, you guys, it's all thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And those of you who have rated and reviewed, please do so if you have not already. And last but not least, share with your fellow Iron Flame friends. We all have that group text of people who are finishing the book and they're all freaking out together and you don't know what to do with yourself, send them this podcast because we have been deemed officially the hangover for Iron Flame cure. And that's all thanks to you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And please enjoy some bloopers. More. We are so (laughs) excited. Sorry. (laughs) And we're off to the races. Doing my my blowjob check here. Okay. (laughs) Themes, theories, and... Wait. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I can do this. To keep her mouth zipped. To keep her mouth. Blah. I need to not have my smoothie right before this because it's just phlegm. It's just nothing but phlegm <laughs> right down here. After.
Good Lord, Jesus Christ. I need the spit in the back of my throat to just go away. I'm Can we have the whole bloopers is. just be you talking about your spit? <laughs> <laughs> I know you better than small child. Are your children okay? Are they screaming? Yeah, Who's they're children laughing. No, they're my children. Boom's class. Professor, professor, professor. Ellen, I'm so sorry with how you're going to be editing this. <laughs> I only slightly hate you. I have to pee so badly. <laughs> Do you want to go pee real quick? Surrey asks, Surrey asks, Surrey asks Felix if he proposes running our own war college. <laughs>